Good evening, everybody. I'll call to order the uh, workshop session for the Arvada City Council for December 10th, 2018. And uh, call upon council. <laughs> we need more of that in this world. So Kristen Rush, if you'll call roll. Bar Williams. Barney is here. <laughs> Mayor Williams? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Marriott? Here. Councilmember Pfeiffer? Here. Councilmember Ford? Here. Councilmember Jones? Here. Councilmember McGough? Here. Councilmember Miller? Here. Very good. We have, we've got uh, three workshops on the agenda tonight. The first is a uh, uh, carry on of, uh, of a presentation I received at the Urban Renewal Board meeting. I thought it would be useful for all of council to, to get it, plus some additions that have been made to it. So, Mr. Devin? Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, we're going to uh, start with Susan Powers, uh, who will be presenting on affordable housing. Could you see? Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Powers. Um, as uh, the mayor mentioned, um, I made a presentation at the Urban Renewal Authority um, because I have, I have. A background in, in urban renewal authorities, so that was that was 20 something years ago for me. But um, I think the staff thought maybe that my background in, as a private developer, as well as um, on the public side of it, might be helpful in talking about this issue that is so important in all of our communities right now. Can you hear that? Okay. Um, I am um, I'm the president of Urban Ventures, which is a development company, real estate development company in Denver, which I started 20 years ago, and I've done mixed-use projects, uh, a lot of re renovation of buildings, um, and a fair amount of affordable housing. Tried to include affordable housing in, er in as many projects as I could, and they're all, th all of those projects are in Denver. And I know that Denver is not the same as Arvada, but there are some parallels here that we thought might be helpful for you to hear about. Um, prior to that, I was the director of the Denver Renewal Authority for 11 years, and, um, and, w and we were involved with a lot of building renovations. This was during the oil and gas recession, which was the real recession, worse than what we, for those of us that lived through both of them, worse than what we just lived through. Um, and half the buildings in downtown Denver were vacant. And it doesn't look like that today, but they were. And, and a lot of the upper floors of those buildings as a way to preserve them um, ended up being renovated for affordable housing. That became the workforce housing, a lot of the workforce housing that is there in, in downtown today. Um, there was no market rate housing built in downtown for 10 years, and the only thing that was built was affordable housing. So um, that's kind of what my background is, and I, um, and I, before that, I worked for the city of Englewood and city of Reno in, uh, in um, uh, city planning and city management. So the, 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 I'm just going to run through some slides here, and the first few of these are really just to set the stage for a discussion about what is affordable housing, and so that we're talking about the same, the same thing, because there are a lot of, a lot of um, discussions about what's attainable housing, accessible housing, affordable housing, everybody's ch changing the, the names of it these days. Uh, and we, I handed out uh, a copy of these, the, the 2018 income limits, because we'll re refer back to them in a few minutes. But the affordable housing continuum is really talking about folks that are homeless all the way up to, to market rate housing. And, and, if, and if folks are homeless, they obviously are below the area median income, have no income, and that's really the, the nonprofits and the government sectors that are addressing those housing needs. Run up to public housing, which is which was what the housing authority, um, that your housing authority in Jefferson County uh, are addressing, and that's 30% of the area median, and which is 20, up to $21,600. And when you're thinking about that, if you ever want to think about what that is on an hourly basis, it's take the first number and cut it in half. So that's about $10.50 an hour is what people are earning if they're living in public housing for a household. Um, and that's for a household of one. Workforce rental housing, uh, it's between 30 and 80% of the area median income. And this is uh, private development. Oh, thank you. Um, and and these, are, these are folks that are 
um, are generally living in the low-income housing tax credit projects that some of which are in, in Arvada, and they're all over the metropolitan area, and we'll talk a little bit about more about them in a minute. And then there's market rate housing, which the market in general is addressing. I mean, it's private development is usually building that, and, and what's happening now is that the rental rates are going up so much faster than the wages are going up that people who should be being able to find housing that's within their income limits um, can't find it anymore. And that's, that is Arvada, that is everywhere. So if you look at that, um, so you're just going to click along, huh? Thanks. Um, if you look at the, um, the workforce, um, the income limits that are there and the, and the workforce that they relate to, go back to that one for a second, if you will. Um, this is taken from your, an actual first year teacher in Arvada. So that is equal to about 15, 15 well, 16 bucks an hour is what the for, for an Arvada teacher is. And you can look at all of the other positions. And these, some of these are regional, but they're, they're very similar to what your, what your firefighters or, or, or bus drivers would, would be making today. And think about those folks. It's important to kind of start putting a face on the, the topic of affordable housing, because these are your kids, your neighbors, your friends. And if you're like me, my son could never afford to buy a house in Denver today. You know, he was born. My, my, my kids were all born here, but if, and one of them was lucky enough to be able to do that before the market changed, but the other one will never be able to. And, that's, and I think that's the anxiety and the frustration we all have right now about what's happening in our communities. And it's really, it is really happening regionally. But with the, with the incomes that are listed here, uh, you can trace those back to what the area median income is for each of these people and then flip back to who's addressing that and you'll see that there's that every, you know so many of these people need help in, in being able to um, obtain housing that they can afford um, okay so and and I have you know I've labeled these why do we care a lot because and I I I, I don't want that to get to be overused here but it is it is the question of what is your responsibility for addressing this need, when when other when up to this point in time maybe it wasn't it wasn't something that came to the city or to the urban renewal authority, um, but when you look at that someone who has a first a first year first grade teacher in Arvada making thirty three thousand dollars, and you look at the average rent that's here, and these are real numbers that, that we have obtained from some sources from the city and from others, and what the typical transportation costs, all these things that are on this list. What it says is what's left then is $429 a month. And you have one flat tire or you have one, one doctor's appointment that has, a, that has a, a follow up and a bunch of co-pays and some medicine that you can't afford and you end up using up $429 very quickly. Or you find that you, the engine is out in your car and it costs $800. I mean, so people that are working in your community, teaching your children, are living on the edge when that's not something we ever heard about in the past. You know, I mean, it's 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 a very different time for us. So the need for affordable housing, we talk about, use a term. Um, next one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is it. Um, about being cost burdened, um, and that means, and this is a general definition around the country, that if you're spending more than 30 percent of your monthly income on housing, then you're really spending more than what you should be on housing because it doesn't leave you, it's the same conversation as before, it doesn't leave you with very much for the other essentials or any, anything else that might, might go wrong. And if then you look at how many uh, people, 85 it says in Colorado, these are statewide, but in Arvada, you're beginning to reach those levels too. 50% of the renters are cost burdened and 85% of cost burdened households have incomes of 50,000 50, or less, which is, again, $25 an hour of a job, $25 an hour positions. And you know, this is, this is city employees as well. So if you're talking about um, that many cost burdened um, people, I mean, and that are renting, I and mean, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of your residents here, and, and they fit into, into many of these categories here, and they're not, and they are spending a lot more than 30% of their income on housing. Uh, and if you go to, yep, and when you spend that, it really, look, you look at the ownership versus the renters who are in that condition, you can see that it really affects the renters 
more than it does the owners, even though ownership here with taxes increasing and values increasing um, start falling into that category as well. Not very different than what you, what you find on the metro area as a whole. Um, just as a reminder, and you know this in your sleep, I'm sure, but I had to learn it, um, how many, what the population is and how many, uh, how many households you have and your average family size and that kind of thing are, are, are listed here just as a, as a reminder um, to us all. 73% of owner-occupied uh, households is a very high percentage. You know, it is, it's, it, is it may be um, what you'd find in, in some suburbs, but it's also, it, it's just, it's a higher number than, than, certainly a higher number than what Denver is, and the national average is closer to 60. Um, so it, it's a good thing that that's the case, but it's not a good thing if people can't afford to stay in their, their homes um, at, at, that, at that, the income levels they have here. Um, in terms of the housing pool, pool, this is the median rent you have, $1,139. And, um, and these are the costs which are, they seem high to me for a median single family home, sale price of $445,000. I'm sure that for those of you that have been around for a long time, those are numbers that you never expected you'd ever see. And, the, and we, you know, we have the same conversations in, um, in, in Denver as well, that it's, you know, you look at a house and you go, there's no way that that house is worth that. And then that's not the point. The problem is, is that people are paying it, whether it's worth it or not. And the housing costs are, are, are being inflated, whether it's arbitrarily by people coming from California with lots of cash and paying full price and above full price, above what the offer price is. But the reality is, is as long as there are jobs here and people are moving from places that are more expensive, they are going to pay more and they're going to continue to, to, to increase here. Uh, this is just looking at uh, what I mentioned earlier is that wages, um, and this is nationally, wages uh, have been much more stagnant than housing prices have been. So if your wages are not going up at the same level as your cost of living is, then there's a major disconnect. This is comparing it to, um, to the actual uh, price of a home and the, or the rent of a unit, a rental unit in, in Arvada. So what do we do about this? Um, and I thought it would be helpful just to, to yeah, that's fine, um, to look at the, uh, at the various groups of people. I mentioned this a little bit before, but this is more detail on who, had, who provides money to address these issues and who takes the responsibility for it. So at the national level, um, the low-income housing tax credits that are issued for apartments, for rental um, buildings in the city, to get built are, are actually federal tax credits. So they issue a certain amount by population to the state and Chaffa, the Colorado Housing Finance Agency oversees the administration of it. There are also federal grants that probably come to the city community development block grants or home funds that are available to the city, uh, but they are coming from, from the federal government. The state, I mentioned that uh, Chaffa administers the tax credit programs in the Division of Housing um, provides other home funds, which are also federal funds that the state gets to divvy up. Lot, very, very competitive process to get this, and we'll talk a little bit more about the low-income housing tax credits in a second. Um, and at the local level, you know, you know this, housing authorities in the city, the city departments that administer the block grant money. And in some cases, there are trust funds that have been created. Denver recently created one, and there are probably five or six other cities around the state that have created these using other sources of money, whether it's a, um, an impact fee or it's an increase, in, it, it's a charge to a developer for, um, for and what, what is it called in Denver? Mm -hmm. Is it the impact fee? Yeah, it is an impact fee, so, which is a, it's every, on a square foot basis, your project, whether it's commercial or residential, pays into a fund you're charged and there's a long formula for how it goes, um, how, how, how the charges are, but everybody pays into this and that just becomes available funding to fill the gap to get these, get these projects built. And then obviously commercial lenders, private developers and public-private partnerships, which is probably what we would be wanting to talk about here. Uh, why is it so hard? Why are we not keeping up with this? Um, with the cost of housing going up, part of the reason the housing costs are going up for new, for new houses are construction costs um, are increasing dramatically. Uh, labor costs are, are very high. There's a lot of competition for it with all the development that's going on 
in Denver, we don't have a labor force for this. Um, during the recession, um, a lot of the skilled labor went back to Mexico and, and isn't allowed to come back into the country. So there's really a, 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 dis, a labor issue on, in the construction industry. It's also not, it's not an industry where the sons and daughters of, of that mason want to be. They want to be in a tech job sitting, working in front of their, their computer all day. Um, so it's not, so there's a, a shortage of people to, to do these jobs. Um, cost of land certainly contributes to that. Impact fees can also be a barrier. I mean, they're, they're helpful on one side and they can be a barrier on the other. And then, you know, the thing that people always complain about, which is not the most important thing that affects housing, but you all get to hear about this, is how long it takes to get through the approval process of a city. I wouldn't say that that's sitting on the top of the list, but it's there. And the role that different cities can play and that we've seen around the metro area are contributing public land. You have lots of, you have parcels of property. I don't know that you have, but I'm assuming every city has public land that's sitting there for different reasons that may, that you may want to contribute to this or to do a ground lease on to help with the cost of it. You can help with the cost of the infrastructure. If you're already in a neighborhood and there's gonna be a, an affordable housing development there and you're putting in some improvements to the infrastructure, that will reduce the cost for, for that development. You can expedite processing and you can, you can help on some of your requirements. We're gonna talk about parking for a minute because parking is one of the largest, well, it's not the largest, one of the biggest issues though in, in for affordable projects because parking requirements tend to be too high um, and, and it costs a lot to build parking. Tap fee waivers, we all like those. They're very hard to get. We all, if we get our water from Denver Water, it's a, very, it's a painful conversation. We'd like, to, we'd like to say that affordable housing shouldn't have to pay tap fees, but it's, you know, that you, you may have control over some of your, uh, some of your um, services, but that one's always been on the list and it's hard to get. Um, and then, you know, supporting the applicants. If you, have a, if you want this to happen, then go out and find affordable housing developers and say, take a look at, at this city and tell us what we can do to help. Um, they're out there, they're working in Adams County, they're working in Jefferson County, and if you want them to be here, um, and, then, and then go and advocate strongly for them, they will not get an allocation from, from Chaffo in the first round. We just got an allocation um, on, on a project two years ago that had gone through six rounds. So this patience is the answer here. And it took, and there were two rounds a year, so it took us three years to get through that cycle. It takes a long time to do it, but, but if you want to do that, you have to kind of get in the game and be consistent every year with it. And then um, go and advocate to have home funds issued to support those projects from the state. So let's jump to parking requirements. And th these are just some statistics here um, of what's happening around the country and around the region. Um, everybody says that every building, everybody hates parking, everybody hates cars and we all have them. And we'll understand that, but the, the number of people in affordable units, you typically have, uh, even if you have larger family sizes, you typically have less drivers in the family. And so cities have reduced the, the ratios and it, it looks as if the, um, the, the, the national average of what's going on um, compared to the 18 year, 18 year average here, you can see is, is certainly going down. And it looks, and I'm, you know, I, you'd have to, somebody can correct me if, I'm, if we're wrong here, but it looks like Arvada's requirement has actually gone up, which is kind of a different direction than what's happened nationally or even regionally. Uh, the ratio of for senior and workforce projects, which are family projects, in all of these combined count, counties in the state where Chaffa has issued tax credits is 1.37. Uh, and we build, we typically build one per unit, not one per bedroom. And, and, that, and that's what we provide. And, and yes, there is a little bit of overflow in some neighborhoods, that can happen, but um, you know, we're kind of in a crisis mode in this region right now, so I would argue that people that are arguing about parking are probably is not as important as the need for affordable housing, but, but I don't need to get reelected, so that's, <laughs> that's your issue. Um, but, there, but if you look at these, you can, you, know, you can certainly look at other cities and counties and, and say um, you have support for lowering your parking requirements because this is what's happening around in the region. Um, I brought some information. I don't have enough for everybody here, so, well, maybe I do. Um, um, but 
the, the community land trust. Can you go to the next one? All right. There are a couple of other things that are just a little different. Um, there's a group that was just started in the last year called Elevation Land Trust. It's a, it was started by um, the, the Gary Community Investment Group, which is a, a foundation basically in, in Denver. And they went to four other foundations and they said, we want to do something about affordable housing and we want to create a fund of money. So they, they, with these foundations, they created $25 million worth of funds. And they are, they create, they are creating and they're dealing now with Aurora, and Westminster and Denver on creating these land trusts. And they're going into neighborhoods that are stable, but on, that are, that are impact, being impacted by the increase in cost. And it's mostly neighborhoods where you have um, a lot of folks that have been there for many generations, elderly people whose, land, whose property values are going up so much. So that, and they're buying ha homes when they come on the market. They're not, they're not going out and making somebody to move by any means. They're buying houses in a neighborhood and they're trying to get a collection of as many houses in these neighborhoods, putting them in a land trust, which means that this group, this community land trust will own the land forever. And then they either sell or lease back the home to the homeowner and therefore the cost of the land is not part of the equation. So they're keeping it at a much more moderate cost. Um, and it's a, it's a national model that's been done at, in this particular way, hasn't been done in Denver, but um, you've probably heard of the, the Urban Land Conservancy, which is a, a group that has been buying housing, buying land at light rail stations and holding that for affordable housing. This is much more of, an, of a comprehensive approach to a whole neighborhood. So I'll leave you with um, information about them. I think they, it might be worth a conversation with them to see if there are any neighborhoods that would fit into this um, in Arvada. Um, their communities or nonprofits are buying vacant buildings when they come up for conversion to af affordable housing. And you know we have the others that are um, that, are, that we've talked about before. The de deed restricted home ownership, because since your housing stock is so high on the home ownership part of it, um, is, uh, is something that we've been involved with where we developed condominium projects that were whatever, 150 units, and then 10 or 20% of them were affordable. And you put a deed restriction on it and say, you can, well, basically you can have 3% appreciation every year and which is oh, the average is is what the, the market is, but with the spikes we've had, you know, you can say C15 percent, and if you move, you can't get all of that. You can get to three percent, um, and and I think it's worked really well in areas where um, where you have a didn't work really well out in Stapleton, and I can answer <laughs> that question why, um, but it's worked really well in some neighborhoods where you didn't have such gross appreciation going on or or dropping in, in, in values, but um, it is, you know, it's just another mechanism to keep the units affordable long-term. Mm -hmm. One thing we realized when we were looking through all of your material um, is that there isn't, there's not a market study that's been done here for Arvada. So we were piecing together information that we got from staff and from other sources, but um, I recently was in, was. Um, on a panel in the city of Littleton uh, talking about their affordable housing issues. And, and they gave me a copy of their, yes, I do have it here. I'm happy to leave this with you as well. A market study they had, that they had, they had done looking at um, the issues with affordable housing. And it was a much more thorough look than I can give you today of looking at what's going on in your market. Most of what I'm saying is, is just from uh, somewhat older census information. And with this market changing so much so quickly, um, it really would be to, to be helpful to you to, to hire somebody, I mean, uh, somebody that does this kind of analysis and give you that background before you make decisions about which, which, where, which direction you wanna go, or maybe if you wanna go there. Um, I mean, they may come back and say, you know, you don't, have you don't have issues here. I don't think that's what anybody would come back and say, but they will be much more precise about whether your issues are with your workforce and your employers here. Are they really related to teacher teachers and your, your first responders? And, or do you, is your issue also at the homeless, homeless issues that you have? Um, and, and, and I think that is just a recommendation that it would be, um, it would be helpful for you, to, for you to move ahead. And I can 
if you want to see what one of those looks like for Littleton. And, and we have them for Fort Collins. And I mean, there are a lot of all of these suburbs that are, that, are being, that are really being aggressive about trying to get ahead of this problem. It's really, it, no, none of us are gonna catch up here, so we can forget about that. I mean, it's, this happens so quickly in the market. Um, so it's, it's really trying to just do as much as you can to keep it from getting any worse, but it's not about, you can't build your way out of this one. I mean, none of us can. Um, and that's unfortunate, but that's the, that's the reality of it. Um, so the getting at a, a, a market study, um, you know, there's the Jefferson County Housing Authority who's, who really does the implementation for you. Um, you know, if, if you want them to be, in, to be more aggressive and find developers to do um, projects here or to be building more public housing here, um, help them find sites. I, I, I don't know enough about the Ridge Homes site to, other than the fact that it's there, it's not in the city not in your city boundaries, but it's next to you, and what a great opportunity that could be to address um, affordable problems, affordable housing problems for a region. Um, and so if that, that's a matter of negotiating with the state, the state land board, whoever owns that, um, you, know, you know, you have to be out there, you have to be in the room with them to, to be able to, um, to express your interest in that and then, and then stand up, It'll, that will not be, and I don't know, who's in the audience here in terms of that neighborhood, but every one of these projects, whether it's senior, I mean, how can you argue, how can we have nimbyism against senior housing? But, it, you know, you can. Um, and I don't understand, I don't understand the nimbyism for a lot of, a lot of the affordable housing because the needs are so, are so dramatic here, but all of these projects, whether they're in, Den or in, a, in Arvada or in the suburb to the south, which, I, which must be Wheat Ridge, um, you know, they will be controversial, but this is really important work. So that, that's a choice you um, have, obviously. And then seek out land opportunities. One of the things that we're doing in Denver is um, working with, this, with Denver Public Schools. I mean, if you think about a place where there's a lot of land, every school has great fields, not taking away the fields, but there's, there's just a lot of property there. Uh, this, this particular model, may not be what you want to do, but in Denver, there's a, there's a huge number, a large number that should be an embarrassment to our community of homeless kids going to school every day. So this is a, there's a proposal out to build housing on the school grounds for these, and it's mostly the moms and these kids um, that are close by and then they go to school. Um, but having, having land available is really the first step. So if you have it, public has it, if, if, the, if the city has it, or if the school district has it, wherever you can find it, um, that is really something that would, that would make the opportunity um, a lot easier. Okay, now let's jump to, there was a question about how low-income housing tax credits work. Um, and and then I will wrap this up. And this is because I know this is, and this is, there's two pages of this and you can, I'm not gonna go through all this, but it's basically, this is a federal program and the state has one as well, but there's, you can, if, if you're a developer and you wanna do a low income, you wanna do an affordable housing project, uh, you go to an investor who, it might be a life insurance company, it might be a bank, um, who has profits and they want to get a credit against the taxes they're gonna to have to pay on their profits. So they invest um, in a low-income housing tax credit project um, and they put their equity and they put that money in, it comes in as equity to the project um, up front. And then they get paid out, they get a tax break for the next 10 years. Um, and it's, you know, some of it's seven and some of it's 10, but it's, it, that is really how that program works. It's been in place, I think it was put in place somebody would know this, by Reagan administration. And it's really the most important uh, tool for, for, uh, for the development of affordable housing on the rental side. So this is just looking at it, and what the question was, well, why would anybody want to do this? Because you know, the, the rents are, are capped, you know, they go up with inflation a little bit, but the rents are capped for a long time. In fact, I think Chaffa is now doing this at um, 60 years or 50 years. Um, and so for a developer to look at this, there are uh, developer fees that are paid um, during, the, during the process. A lot of it is deferred until it's actually operating, but it's a pretty, pretty substantial fee. And that is, so people that have a business model that's based on that and want to do something that is, um, that is good for the community, there's not a lot of upside over the course of it. 
Um, at the end of it, they can sell it for market, but more and more cities are saying, we want this to be affordable for a lot longer. Um, I was, when I was at Dura in 88, 87, we did several different tax credit projects, including the, the um, 100 unit apartment built, apartments that are above the tatter cover that, that John Hickenlooper developed in his pre-brewing days. And, uh, and we, they were 30 year, and, and we all said 30 years, that's God, you know, it's a long time and we'll never have that. Well, here we are. And all of the, there are, there are six, seven or eight projects downtown, or more than that, that are all expiring. The tax, you know, so the, all of them can be market rate. Now, most of them are owned by people who are gonna extend them, but that risk is there um, and the city is trying to get ahead of that and buy, buy these projects, these developments, because you can't, I mean, if you lose it, it costs, a hell of a lot more to build one than it does to keep it. Um, so, the, so the tax, low-income housing tax credit um, mechanism is really critical, and it's very competitive. As I said, the state gives them out, and it's and they don't give them out. They there are maybe eight projects a year that get selected for this. Um, the state also has a tax credit project, um, which is less competitive, um, but it you know it's still. There's still a lot of people that are trying to build this and, and because of the cost of construction going up and land going up, the gaps are growing every year. The value of the tax credits, because under the last tax bill that was, that was approved, um, there are less, you know, there's a less of a demand for the tax credits uh, because because corporations are paying less taxes, so they have less of a need for it, so the value of that tax credit goes down. So it used to be, you could get a dollar, you know, a dollar for a dollar. I mean, you, it would be a, a, you know, it would be, it would be a one to one, and sometimes even more than that. And now it's you can get them for like 93 cents on a dollar. So it's so all of these are moving parts that affect the um, the the way housing is developed and the inevitability of a financing gap. So this is just to say there's always going to be a gap, and even with the tax credit revenue that comes in. Uh, these projects have to go to the state. They usually get money from the city, uh, and there are layers and layers of, of um, financing that go into each one of these. And and it's you know it's a kind of a brain damaging process, but it what it produces is really critical for a community. Um, so if there are if there any so if anybody wants to have a side conversation about low income housing tax credits, I can do it. But I think that's probably enough there. The last thing is that I I brought this was a, in a publication from the Denver Foundation printed last month that was really um, filled with interesting articles. And um, this one was about what the faith community is doing in terms of affordable housing. And there's a group that, is, that, is, that has formed together that is bringing all the congregations together, the churches together, talking about what land they have that might be available for this. Not to create the housing inside their institutions, but on their land, what can they do? Um, and that's you know that's another another avenue here, and it's uh, and it's, a, it's kind of a, a national model. This is I don't think anybody has done this around the country yet. So people are watching this to see what comes of it. But there, it's a it's a, a very interesting approach when we have such a crisis here that all of these groups are stepping up. Okay, any questions? Mr. Marriott, you want to lead us off? I'm happy to. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. I've got a number of questions or a few questions um, kind of I wrote them down kind of in the order of the presentation I guess the first one I would start off with was um, you know you, who are the people who are living in these affordable housing are they like the like the incomes you gave us here a first year firefighter a first year teacher or are these seniors who are on a fixed income or who, who's it's, actually the yeah. majority of people occupying you know, some of the income. some of the developments are built specifically for for seniors, and they are people who are living on a fixed income right. and you know are getting Medicare for health health coverage. Um, and the ones that are family um, are all of the above. Even though firefighters and teachers are are really at the upper level, upper end of that that housing spectrum or the income spectrum, um, and I would say in general that a firefighter or a Colorado nurse on that list may not qualify. Um, for this, but the first year teachers would. So if they are, if they are, if you look at the at the income there, and you say 
at, if it's a single person she's, and, it's, and they're making $33,000, they are at the 50% here, between 50 and 60% of the area median income, they qualify. Um, right. they're, but they're also, I mean, they are, we, we developed across the street from uh, Regis University, and, and we have plenty of Regis employees that qualify. Right, okay. So the, the question that would bring to me, if that's who's living in these, is people just starting their career, a first-year firefighter, mm -hmm. or a first-year teacher, or a first-year bus driver, what's their income look like? Eight years into their career, do they still qualify? Eight well, they have to. They have to qualify uh, on an annual basis. So they are, and and I think that you have, you know, they would be going up a bit here in in, in income, but the wages are not raised, are not going up that high that it would force anybody out of here overnight. But, you know, so I think a, if you if you took a bus driver or a, or a bank teller or a um, you know, someone that worked in the hotel industry, you know, one of the, 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 uh, the room, room cleaners and that kind of thing, you know, those folks would probably be there for, for quite a few years and qualify. Right. But, it, but there are plenty that, that move on, too. I mean, this is not, this is not um, meant to be a program that keeps people in, the, in this housing forever. And I think you'd see, you'd see that there is some turnover, but in this market, there's nowhere for them to go, you know, so it's hard to, it's hard for people to move out out who, of here. Who, who audits them annually and makes a determine what, determination whether they get to stay or whether they don't get to stay? Or does their rent just go up or down based their on? Their rent goes up or down based on their qual yeah, what, what their income is. So and, they won't get, they won't necessarily, they won't get kicked out, but they just have to pay a higher rent. And, and if their income goes up to the area median income, does their unit then just becomes a, not a affordable it, unit, an affordable it just becomes unit. a market unit? It is, doesn't, yeah, and it doesn't happen very often because most, in most cases they, they are moving on, you know. They are moving on if they're if they're able to buy a place where they're moving into a market rate unit. There, uh, and many of these projects are mixed income, so they are not all in, uh, all at this level. There are some that are market rate units, so they could qualify for those if their income continues to go up. So a development might have some market rate units in yep. it and some affordable units in it, and if they earn their way out of their affordable unit, they just stay in their unit and pay the market rate? Right. Is that the deal? Yep. And, and then does the, whoever's the audit, I mean, running that this with, development yeah. have to then turn another unit into an affordable one to? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Because they, they got subsidized, yeah. right? To, this is all subsidized it's, housing, so somebody right. subsidized but this. But they're, just, they're always better. having a certain number of them that are market rate units, so they would just keep that balance there. I mean, they, you know, and, mo and most of the, to be really competitive in, for low income housing tax credits, most of these projects are not mixed income. I'm saying that that is, that's one model of what I actually think that's a healthier model to have in a, in a development. But most of them to be, to get, to get tax credits, they're pushing the incomes down as low as possible. So you end up with, with people that are, that are really at the lower, lower income levels, that are low, below 80% of the median income. There and the, and Chaffa requires that this this all be certified to them by a, a third party. I mean, so there are you know the all the documentation has to be provided by the developer in Chaffa. Chaffa. Yeah, and and on an ongoing basis, right? Yep. So they have yep. to at some point they have to ask their residents for their tax return right. or something. You've got to prove up, or you right. don't get to keep your subsidized unit. Okay. Yeah. So in preparing to, for this, I was reading the material. I went back and I looked. And so uh, when I started my career, it was actually a little after I started my career because I lived in my parents' house till I was 23. And I had already started my that career. That explains so much. <laughs> <laughs> the best years of my life, I can tell you. Um, but uh, the, uh, um, what, the year that I moved out on my own, I earned $11,000 that year. So you can tell it was a long, long time mm -hmm. ago. But my, uh, the place I moved into, I rented an apartment and it cost $550 a month. So I was paying well over 50% of, of my gross income in, in rents. And of course, there were none of these programs around. So I did what virtually everybody did who was my age, and that's I got a roommate or two and moved out and had roommates. And with several of us, it was completely affordable. Right. And um, the, it seems to me, and then, you know, as, of course, as I progressed in my career, I made more money, and at some point, I didn't have to have roommates anymore. It was quite a, quite a luxury. Then no, I you just, got a wife. Then I just had a girlfriend. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> but, uh, but what happens in these affordable units when that, 
first year firefighter gets this affordable unit and then gets a girlfriend or I mean, they get audited and out you go or yeah, well, I think change one the thing, rent or if you look at you these numbers, your first year Denver firefighter or, or your own firefighters are, are probably not going to they don't really this. qualify. So a teacher, so well, how about a teacher, teacher, a first year teacher? Um, and they don't I mean, they don't get when people move into the unit, they qualify them based on, on who they are. And, you know, there's you're going to there are probably people who are taking advantage of the system who are not who are not qualified down the road because their circumstances change and nobody knows that but there isn't that's a very that's very few people that that happens to and if they if they move if somebody moves in with them and it's the same thing in public housing i believe that if if somebody moves in and has an income then they they can't stay there in, in that unit they're not going to kick them out overnight but that but if their income doubles um when the next certification happens there, it's, there's going to have to find other housing. And if there's somebody from the housing authority that can, that can say that's not true, is that right? Hi. You want to come down so, and yeah. verify for us? Yeah, I don't know what the housing authority does, but I, I, I've heard of those stories. Yeah. Well, if you come to the mic. Yep. But if you're talking about LIHTC, actually they only have to qualify at, at move-in. And then they can stay as long as they want to stay, even if their income goes up. If they're making 100 grand, they can still stay, but they usually don't. I mean, it's not the best place for them to be. They wanna buy their own home. They're just like everybody else. They wanna buy a home too. So as their income goes up, they most of the time move out. What about public housing? What are you doing? So Jefferson County has no public housing. We don't, do not operate public housing. But as far as Section 8 multifamily, which you've got a few in, you've got some in Arvada, that housing, if someone moves in and they have someone who puts them over income, then they go to the, to the maximum rent, which is like a market rate. Hmm. And then they can stay if they can continue to pay that. It's all about not displacing people. Right. And any idea how, how, of the ones you have here in Arvada, how many of those are paying the market rate or what percentage maybe of those are paying I, the market rate versus? Not off the top of my head, but I can get you the information. Okay. Not, not a big deal. I just, yeah. just It's not that many yeah. because... The units we have here are not exactly, you know, the most, yeah, they're not the places everyone wants to live. So they, they don't usually stay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. So thank you for, for answering those questions. I want to move on to kind of the development, you know, developing uh, affordable housing. <clears throat> you said one of the, on one of these slides, it had an interesting term. It, it was uh, one of the, I think, hurdles to, um, developing affordable housing with stringent requirements. As a developer, you've developed before, obviously. Mm -hmm. What what are the stringent requirements that that impede? Um, and I I I'm not, I will tell you what what this is, but I will not argue in, um, against it. Uh, if you're in and Denver, has a lot of historic districts. If you're built in, and if you're building in a historic district, then your requirements for what it looks like are and what materials you use and what the design is are much higher than if you were building outside of historic districts. So that would be one, even though I think that, I mean, I believe in historic districts, so I think that that one you can rationalize, but other developers might say, well, it's costing me whatever, 10% more. Um, if you have to dedicate property for, um, for right away, if you have to build you know, I mean, build sidewalks. It depends on what your what your city requires you to be to do as a developer. Those may not be stringent, but they are things that cost money that are added to the cost of, of building a house. Um, but I think a lot of it is on the on the, and I think you can build really attractive. And the burden is on us to do that, and and on the cities to make us do that. To build housing that when you drive by it, you say you would never know it's affordable housing. It shouldn't it shouldn't be looked at any differently. Um, should get awards, and it doesn't. I don't think it costs any more to do that, with that one exception of in historic district. Right. Now, the city of Aurora, I should say, has, um, and I've heard this. I've never done, done development there. They have um, but pretty high design standards in general that people say have said for affordable housing, um, it is much more expensive to build there than it is in in other cities. And that's not just a historic district. That's just you know the amount of brick you have to have, the amount of whatever. So so I think that's those are the kinds of issues. If you have to dedicate, I mean, if you if you're in a in a community that has um, 
a storm sewer system that is, or, or if Denver Water happens to come by and say, this line is, is 100 years old, and because you're the first in the neighborhood to redevelop that site, you have to, re, you have to replace the main. Um, and we've all had those conversations, and you know, you just kill, it kills the project. So, but it would kill the project if it were a market rate project too. You know, I mean, so some of those extraordinary expenses are, um, are just things we just need to keep in mind. Right, okay. So not really any different for an affordable project than just a... Yeah, just well, it hurts more for an affordable. I mean, you, would, you know, for, for a market rate, you might be able to say, okay, I can, rash, I can, I can handle this by raising the cost of a unit, and, and an affordable, you can't do that. You know, you, you're maxed out at a, at a price. Right, right, okay. So that, that kind of got, got me to the... Oh, let me, excuse me for interrupting. I thought yeah. of another one. Um, and this is one that is with every, every fire department, and I'll tell you, I, I love firefighters, but after 9-11, there's nothing that a firefighter will ask for that you can say no to, and I know that. So it's, uh, <laughs> but so the fire department's requirements for uh, sprinkling the level, what, what kind of ho housing needs to be fully sprinkled now, um, you know, have risen. Uh, all of those are kinds of requirements that are really at your discretion. They are above and beyond the building code and the fire code in many cases, and you are, you're being asked to, to, to have a higher level here for, you know, legitimate reasons, but maybe that's not as, 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 as necessary um, in your community. So I, right. I love firefighters. Right. <laughs> yeah. We we love firefighters too, but, and we've disagreed with them on sprinkling uh, residential yes. houses. So. Yes, so that's it. Good. Okay, so that, that, I was the one I asked the question about the the economic case for how to, you know how do you, how do you build uh, build housing, and I guess I want to understand a little bit more about the the LIHTC nine and four percent programs, the tax credits that you as a developer get to sell. In a 9% program, do you get to sell 9% of the cost every year for 10 years? So you're getting 90% of it as, as a tax credit, or okay. do you get 9% total? How are you doing that? You want, you want to come up here and help answer these questions? Um, the 9% the, the nine he was asking. 9% or 4%. 9% or 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 of the 4% work. It's not 9% a year for, for nine years. No, no it's, it's not even 9%. It's a, cal it's, it's a weird right. calculation. Right. But um, the example you have up there is really good because it talks about the total development cost being nine million and your equity being about seven. So that's paid out over, depends, mostly 10 years. So that's paid out over 10 years. That, so that's what, the, that's what the value of the tax credit over time. That's the value time. of the credit to the investor. Right. So that's the, that's the um, credit they get on their taxes over 10 years. And then the 4%, there's two different kinds of 4% deals. You can do a straight 4% that's not competitive and then there's a 4% state where you get 4% from the federal government and 4% in state credits, and again, credits to the investor that are that is a competitive, and it's actually become so competitive, it's almost the same as a nine anymore. But those, mm -hmm. you know, you figure it's about 7%. You know, even though it's four and four, it never really equals right. out. Right, but, it, but, it's set, but, but that's every year for 10 years. That's not just one time. No, but no, it's, it's spread out over it's, it over is. Yeah, it's one time, you count that as your investment in the project, but it's paid out to the investor over, over 10 years. They get the, they get the credit over yeah, 10 years. period. Well, Sorry, they get the amount. credit. They get, they they get, get a tax credit. But they get equal. a tax credit of, of $7.8 million right. paid to them over, over, a ten year over, period. over 10 years. Right. So, right. so they're getting, uh, you know, I don't know, in this particular example, they'd be getting about 8% per year for 10 years or 8 Yeah. 80 percent or something yeah, is right. is what the tax credit right. is is worth. So as a developer, how do you make money on these? Well, it, in these cases, it's purely on the developer fee, and and Chaffa allows these are these are projects that are that take an awful lot of upfront money. Oftentimes, developers have to buy the land and take the risk on getting the credits and all that. So there's it's something like 18 percent. It's like a tax. You're allowed to have an 18 percent fee. That's not paid out until everything is, in general, it's deferred, um, until everything is, is occupied and, and running. Right. And, and, and is oftentimes that... you, for, you forgo a part of your developer mm -hmm. fee, especially as a housing authority. We give it back to the project to make it work. Right, well, and, and right. obviously, 
government is different than right. but private developers private, do too. Private, a lot private of them private end up doing a developer, but, and nonprofits certainly but, do as well. Of, of that fee that you get as a developer for developing nonprofit, what kind of costs do you have built in there, or is that a is that you know in construction a lot of times you do you know kind of a a time and materials type of a type of a uh, a, a bid process or a pricing of something. In developing this kind of stuff, do you do the same thing where then that, that's, your, that's your net on top or, or, or do you have that at risk? How does that work? Well, I mean, there's a lot that has been at risk that you're getting reimbursed for. So I think that is, that, that is a fee to compensate for the risk that's taken and all the, the staff time and any consultants that were part of our team. That we're, that we're involved in right. the project. So, to this project cost. So it just right. goes back into the project and right. it's paid out at close. Right, right. So as a, as a private developer, it's, it's what you get in exchange for the staff time you put into right. it and your, your time and your effort and, right. and, and the time you put in. Okay. Um, okay. Um, last question I had was, it seems like with the, 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 that, that there's competition for this type of development. Is that, yes. is that true? It seems like. Very much so. But yet different parts of our city are different. Like for instance, I, I know uh, we talked to a, a developer who builds these type of projects in Denver and they're not required to build any parking at all. They, it's all just street parking parked onto the gridded streets. But yet in the suburbs, there's not always necessarily gridded streets and you know, available street parking. So it puts a different burden on it. How, how does that work in the suburbs? I mean, how can a suburb ever compete with someplace like Denver that's more of an urban environment for this type of stuff. Well, and I don't know this, uh, but I, uh, for with facts, but I doubt that Chaffa has ever approved a project with no parking. Yeah, that. Would I think be a that shock. would be a shock to me. And I think what you're talking about are the, the, the tiny, the small units, the micro units that are being built, and they are not, they're not affordable. I mean, they are. They may say they are, but they're. You know, they they're 350, 350 square feet, and it costs a thousand dollars a month. So, right. um, if you want, if you want to be in a hotel room, that's that's fine. Um, so, and there's a market for that, and and they are they are not building parking, and I and I guess that the the uh, we don't know the impact of that yet because the first ones have just opened up in Cherry Creek, and we'll see what kind of impact that has because there are people that have cars. I mean, they're they're not I mean, the ones that are. Easier to build with what anything that's like right in the smack, smack downtown that has light rail that's you know you're right there with all the transportation you can probably get a, a lesser parking requirement on it um, but I don't think that I mean I, that no private lender would allow you to build it we've never built a project without mm -hmm. any parking we've never but we've never gone below one per unit one per unit but some have right some have done them some have done for seniors done, well for seniors or for homeless housing or special special service housing that is, that is um, addressing the needs of people with special issues um, that are not going to have how they're not going to have cars um, yeah you can, you can go down I think that the, for seniors it's, it's you know I, I'm not sure it's more than one half of space per unit but there's definitely some because you know people are still driving some cars right okay hey, last question and thank you for your thanks for answering all these questions I appreciate oh, sure. it the uh, um, now I just lost it. Hang on one sec. Let me I get it back here. Um, the, the other develop uh, the other municipalities around us that have had some success developing uh, or, or promoting or getting developed within their city uh, these affordable housings have they been providing subsidy in any form on top of. The, the, Many of them the, have the subsidy that comes, and so what? What forms? How are they doing it by directly cash, or are they? How are they subsidizing? How are the municipalities using tax dollars to subsidize these? So, well, some are using, and many are using community development block grant funds. So you have a certain amount that's coming to you, and just a question of priority on how you use that. Yeah. So that is that is making up some of the gap. Some cases they're providing land. Um, but uh, you know, other, I mean, I'm not sure that there's anybody other than Denver that's taking money out of the general fund and putting it into housing. I mean, I think just think that's uh, it's right. mostly taking funds that you have or resources like land right. uh, that I, you could. I saw Mr. Talbot is here. I, I think we use all our community development block grant funds for uh, Section 8 vouchers. Is that true? No, that's not. 
what do, what do we use ours for? Well, the CDBG, we use it for, you know, we don't we get a limited amount, so, you know, somewhere in excess of 400 grand. We've been using it for the essential home repairs program for rehab. Then we've been using it for public services through the process. I think it was November 5th that right. you went to basically designate money for different uh, nonprofits, you know, for the services they do. CDBG, just remember, you can't build housing with block grant funds, but what you can do with CDBG if you decide to do it is you can provide infrastructure or offsite improvements with the CDBG funds, but the feds have actually built a prohibition on CDBG. You can't use it for direct construction of, of affordable housing, for example, but it'd be those ancillary costs that are, is allowed. Typically, it's infrastructure. Right, and that's different from our Section 8 totally. program. Totally. Right? Yeah, Got Section it. 8, uh, totally oh, different totally program. Different. Okay, great. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Ms. Ford, you're next. So you made a comment about um, the 73% ownership in Arvada that that was somewhat strain, uh, uh, strange and um, you know it's my belief that the reason why we have such a high percentage of ownership here in Arvada is that we have a very high percentage of older mm -hmm. uh, residents. The one thing that I struggle with and I've been thinking about as we're looking at the situation, um, and I don't have the demographics right in front of me, but I know that we have a very high percentage of high income earners in Arvada and our low income earners is a small percentage. So one of the things that I was kind of thinking about is, is you know, has anyone ever done a study to look at, you know, a healthy city? where there's good variety for mm -hmm. um, the low wage earners as well, you know, because we always hear about the mountain towns being so, um, you know, uh, disproportionate yep. Yep. in terms of, yep. of, of, you know, uh, lower income workers. It, it, has there ever been a study that, you know, with a certain percentage of residents, you know, you should have a housing to meet you know, a certain percentage for uh, low wage earners. And because, and, and, and then the other thing that I just wanna, well, go ahead and answer that first and then I'll tell you something you else. Know, there's I'm a lot about. that's been done on the uh, jobs housing balance. Mm -hmm. And that is looking at, um, you know, the incomes earned by those jobs and the, and the, and the, uh, the cost of housing. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that's out there. I can't say that I've seen one that is specifically, asked, you know, looking at what the, what's a healthy balance there. But it, it probably gets into that, that same conversation about, about um, the wage, the wage levels and the cost of housing. So we could, we could look at that and see what we can find. Um, then another thing that I have often thought about as I've sat here, uh, looking at different uh, projects. I know in Arvada, and I believe it may be true of Denver, but maybe you can help me on this. It seems to me that our, our statistics tell us that it's the lower wage earners that tend to have less cars and tend to use more public transportation. Mm -hmm. Yet when it comes to the actual development, we're actually developing higher end apartments near our transit. Mm -hmm. So the people that really need that transit right. are not able to use right. it. And so that seems to me very uh, counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I do struggle with the parking requirements. This is something else I've been thinking about as well because I live in a condominium complex that's pretty average uh, priced. And... Um, I have been observing my own complex and I know for a fact that within 10 years there has been a tremendous change in the desire for more parking space. I see it even in my own little area of this large complex where more people are parking on the streets. You have a greater percentage of each unit having two cars mm -hmm. and sometimes more. And so that, that's, an, that's something that I'm a little bit uh, concerned about. The other thing that I struggle with too when it comes to um, affordable housing, as John was saying, you know, um, I 
I was a teacher, uh, a, a, a teacher at one time, and lived in an apartment with a husband, of course, who had a, a salary as well. And we did not, you know, as John says, I agree, we don't, you don't stay in that one place. You keep growing and making more money. And, and when I look at, um, when we've looked at a lot of our lower income housing, affordable housing, um, uh, voucher housing, um, it seems to me that the greatest percentage of people living in those, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, are single women with children or single women. And then of course you have your people with disabilities who are not gonna have any opportunity just like seniors, you know, to make any more money and definitely um, need it. So um, I, I guess I'm, you know, I, we've heard a lot about affordable housing and I'm definitely in agreement that we need housing that's affordable for everybody. Cause even I, I, you know, my husband and I just happen to go by an open house the other day to an area where we would like to live mm -hmm. and went into a house that was 599,000. And at my age and, you know, yeah. it's not affordable for me. And yet, you know, could I maybe if I add up everything I own? So, you know, I, I guess I, I'm just, and you know, you're saying too that we're never gonna have enough. So how, do, how much should we have? That's really my question because- I'm glad you got to a question. <laughs> did, I, did I get, I ruminate quite yeah, a bit. Yes, I'm you sorry. do. It's, <laughs> so, and, and that's, uh, that's a woman's way of ruminating, just okay. so you know, okay. we talk Thank while you. we think. Thank you. Um, so, so if we could right. get that information, that would really be helpful because we're never gonna solve the problem right. here in Arvada. But to understand what we should have, I think is. I think that this leads back to the conversation about getting a market study. Right. I mean, I'm, I am giving you, you know, numbers from up here, but you really need somebody who's looking at what's happening in your community now, what the prices are, what the what the wages are, what's happening with wage growth in Arvada, um, and 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 you can't can't get that from, from this kind of conversation. And, and you know yes. people who do that? Oh, yes. Okay, great. Yes. So you can will, give that, in fact, I will give that information to staff. And I'll give you, I give think you that, that would be great. Yeah, be great. I think yeah. you, a lot you. of your questions, I think, are questions that can be addressed in that kind of study, too. I mean, you can ask the parking questions, too. I mean, you should, because that's part of the, the equation here right. as well. Thank you. Sure. Great. Uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you so much. Actually, um, if you, thank you for being here. I really sure. appreciate it. your presentation was fantastic and I love your candidness. I relate well to that. I actually have a question for Mr. Talbot, if you wouldn't mind, sir. I work for you. <laughs> thank you, sir, I appreciate that. So um, we did a study and we found some land in Arvada that could potentially be used for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Could we have an update on what that looks like? Are we calling Habitat and Archway and saying come build with us? Um, I would be happy. I'll give you a brief on that. You are you going to have a, a presentation later on the progress on the comprehensive plan? And there are two things that have happened. And one of what I was going to explain a little bit what's going on with that piece of ground that the Housing Authority acquired. But I can give you a picture of it right now if you'd like, because you're asking the question. So if what it's in your presentation, I mean, it can wait if. If I'm messing up your flow, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> Very briefly, where the status is, is that through action of the Housing Authority and cooperating with the Utilities Department of the City, we obtained about a 1.2 acre site down on Carr Street, close to 52nd. We've been waiting to try to come up with a concept and a proposal from Habitat for Humanity, who was, we actually talked to a couple of developers. Most of them wanted a lot more density on the site than we thought might be uh, workable for the site. But Habitat, the model would be for home ownership, we're looking for basically common wall construction that we could easily put on that site that would be a good fit for it. Matter of fact, we're gonna have a pre-construction, I think it's called a pre not pre-construction, a um, prior meeting, development meeting with the development staff with Habitat here this week to take a look at the concept for that site to see what they can do because there's been some difficulties in trying to fit the type of model the type of concept they do for home ownership onto a site of that size. But it's looking encouraging because Habitat is interested. We just try to kind of come up with a concept that works for the site. 
I'm really excited to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited that we're moving on. <laughs> I know. So that's one piece, yep. right? But there were several more. Um, in terms of city-owned land, none. Okay, that's the one for the city-owned land that we've had. That was actually the first time that the housing authorities become a landowner and that we've been utilizing a site that basically tried to provide for some attainable housing on that site, which would be home ownership. The other things we've been involved in have either been in preservation of existing housing, Marcella Manor, as you might recall, and uh, as Susan was, was basically alluding to that issue that basically some of these projects, after they run out that affordability period, what happens to them? Marcella was one of them. I'm going to illustrate again at the, uh, the session on the uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, there's a project also down in Car 90, I believe it's 96 units that we participated in without getting into the details to try to preserve that as very low income affordable housing through Section 8 because it's a Section 8 assignment of units to it. So we have that issue that we're dealing with is those projects that are going to lose that affordability window because they basically run out the requirements. We're working on a couple of those. You probably really also remember the one we've been working with uh, Cornerstone over at uh, Sheridan and 64th. Um, that's run into some difficulties and it has to do with a private landowner coming to terms with the developer for a price on the land and under terms that would make sense for the development to proceed. That's one has run into uh, some obstacles. So. Okay, Mr. Jones. Don't go away, Mr. Talbot. <clears throat> So a lot of my questions and ruminating have been done. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, but a question on, um, in the presentation, uh, uh, Ms. Powers talked about the, the division of housing, the home funds. Are those things that we're taking advantage of today? Um, to qualify for home funds, there are certain criteria that a community or a county has to meet. We don't meet those qualifications to be a direct recipient for home funds. Okay. However, we can go to the State Division of Housing and apply to get home funds that go to the state. We've done that in the past actually quite a bit, but most of it was been oriented to either energy conservation work on existing homes or for housing rehabilitation on existing single family. The only other time we've really been in concert on homes where we've worked with a private developer in a couple of projects. I think Jefferson Green is one, Sheridan uh, Town. We've actually worked with them to try to secure an allocation of home funds to go into the project, but we weren't the direct applicant. We were supporting trying to facilitate having that federal grant from some of the State Division of Housing, the home funds, right. go into the project. But the only way we can access it as a community is to go to the state and okay. then make a pitch and a proposal to the state. Okay, thank you, I appreciate yeah. that. Um, <clears throat> so, you mentioned, I'm sorry, you can go and sit down, I'm sorry. You're, you're, re you're released, you're dismissed. <laughs> At least for now. Um, you mentioned early in your, in your presentation about kind of the NIMBY, the unfortunate uh, NIMBY attitude. Um, what have you been successful in as it relates to education and helping, you know, neighbors around projects that you've been involved with um, to to better understand affordable housing. And let me, I'm going to ask a question and a question. We're, we're trained to do that um, <laughs> because even though if we were in court, I'd be objecting. Right. <laughs> Compound questions are not permitted. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, because uh, talk to people and there's affordable and attainable, and I've been corrected on both, and and so because some people hear affordable and they automatically go to a section eight type of a housing situation. And then you hear attainable and you think of the firefighters and the nurses and the school teachers. And so that, so that's a compound yeah. question, I apologize. That's okay, I'll give you a compound answer. Um, <laughs> and it's, I mean, it is, they, they all mean the same thing, in, yeah. but in people's minds, if they, if they want to oppose it, then they have an image of what that person is and how they're not a productive member of society and they don't deserve this subsidy. I mean, you know, so, and, you, and I don't know if you're gonna be able to change that person's mind, but I think it's, a lot of it is education. I mean, it's what we're seeing in the country now. I mean, it's, we have to, you have to 
get out there and find some advocates in the neighborhood. They're out there because they're all, they're all dealing with this with their kids and their teachers and whatever. So find advocates, and they may be sitting in the audience. I'm hoping some of them are. There are. Um, and they are. Um, and you know, let them do some of the fighting for you. You know, for this for this issue. It's not. It is not. It's not pleasant. It isn't. And because people say some of the most disgraceful things about humanity, that I, you know, I just listen to people's comments, and you think, what world are we living in that you think this way? But. It, you know, it's just, sometimes it's just the right thing to do and you just have to you, you educate as much as you can and then you, you try and put a face on the issue. I mean, one of my favorite stories was from, if you want to talk about housing costs, San Rafael, California, where the Chamber of Commerce, because they were having such a housing problem there, the Chamber of Commerce led uh, a, 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 um, a bond issue, actually, for affordable housing to be built. And they put on all of the city buses and everywhere you could see a sign that said, picture of a firefighter, um, thank you for letting me save your house from burning down. Too bad I can't live here. Thank you for letting me teach your kids. Sorry, I can't live here. I mean, and, and I think it's that we have, we have lost what that face is. And I don't want it to all be firefighters and teachers because I think the lowest wage earners, the ones that work in the pizza stores or the coffee shops, those are the ones that are struggling more than the teachers and the, and the firefighters are. And, I, and you just have to figure out how to get past that image of these people don't deserve to live here or we don't want them here and we'll just send them to Lakewood. Right. Um, so. Okay, no, thank you. Well, But yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not te I'm not going to that meeting, by the way. <laughs> I've been to enough of those meetings. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's hard a, it's because um, it's, it's all over, you know, yeah, it's not it just in our battle. But it's really wonderful, and I don't know who all you are, but it's wonderful that you have members of your community that are, that are there saying, hey, this is a problem, we want to help you solve it. So no, they, we, we hear from them often, and it's awesome. Good. Um, and uh, they know who they are. A <laughs> um, uh, couple of other questions. Um, uh, that haven't been asked. So you cite the example of Westminster um, and the 70 units that are coming up there kind of in the new downtown Westminster area. Mm -hmm. Do you know exactly... Uh, I don't. You're, oh, not, you're, not, you're not familiar yeah. with how they did that? I don't, I don't know. Does anybody here know if that was a tax credit project? Uh, I don't was, know. Is it an affordable project? That they're mm -hmm. It's in your presentation here. No. Well, it's, well, it's referenced in your presentation. Well, I think that's the... Um, all right. I think it's workforce living. Yeah, workforce. Okay, so there's another word, workforce. Right. Um, so they've, they've dedicated 70 units um, to this particular project to be workforce attainable. Um, but again... Um, so that has to be a tax credit project then. Okay. It had, it had to be one that, that went through the 9% and okay. got, it, got an allocation from the city, I mean from the state. Okay, yeah. so you really don't know. I don't, I mean, I'm not familiar with it beyond this. Okay, um, and then... Oh, but we can get our friends in Westminster right. to get us some information. No, that'll be, and that'll be good. Um, so you, you're currently... Uh, working with or developing affordable housing? I have, um, we just completed, mo most of what I've done is on the for sale side, I mean affordable for sale, and it's part of projects that are bigger that a portion of them are affordable. And then I have a partner that does the, the tax credit projects and we do this on, on property together. This is a former convent up at 52nd and Federal called uh, Mary Crest Convent that we've been involved with for about 12 years. So we have, so we do a lot of, we, you know, we work together on all these things. So we have what, we have an apartment project that just broke ground two weeks ago and there's already a, 60, a 72 unit um, tax credit project that opened about four years ago on the property. So being involved in it as you are, when you see a community like Arvada who has a 73% owner occupied market, does that discourage you from considering making an investment in a community like Arvada? No, not at all. I mean, um, it, just, it probably says that there's more of a need than on the rental side. Okay. If anything. And the reason why I ask is because we don't have a lot of 
builders pounding down the door to, to build affordable you units. have to go find them they're out there and I can introduce you to a few I'm not I'm I'm focused in other areas now but uh, but right. I I know that there would be developers that would be interested in, in working here. So if you and if you could if you could figure out where you know and help with some of these incentives and figure out the land or I, you know I mean a lot, any of those things. But I could you know I could send a couple of people to you to sit down and say what would it take um, in this community to do this um, and they're out there. Okay, thank you very much. I really sure. appreciate your presentation. Sure, Mr. Pfeiffer. Hey, Susan, great job. I appreciate, um, Hi. yeah, I'm over here. Hi. Sometimes the voices <laughs> just come from different areas. Um, and yours comes from down on high. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I appreciate the, the presentation. And, you know, I don't really have questions. I'd more have comments probably to, to this council and staff is, you know, the issue more than anything for me and, and being on the, the community table board has been like our working families just, that just cannot make enough. You know, mm -hmm. I... I appreciate John's struggle of a young teenager, young 20s yeah. bachelor pad story, but at the end of the day, it is a single mom and two kids right. living in a car that have nowhere to go and she works three jobs right. and the only stability those kids have is the school. Right. And I worry about those individuals who work all day, all night, just to keep the thin thread of the family together. So I think it's important that our staff and our council finally get the... Uh, the strength and the courage to have the conversation uh, for the betterment of our community. You know, we talk in Arvada about being neighborly and taking care of one another and, and doing good things, um, but we don't show it in this area. So, you know, I appreciate, you know, Mr. Jones, you know, some of his questions are probing in the right direction, but I don't know if we've been friendly enough for a developer to come and talk to us. And so well, I would expect had them, that it, might be the case. It is. I can guarantee you it is. Yeah. And so I would encourage one of those developers that would be a developer I would talk to. And I'd love to have that conversation and mm -hmm. see where that goes. Right. Um, so I'm more challenging my, my peers and staff that this is this is a conversation we've been having since I've been on council and I'm going on mm -hmm. year eight. Last fall, I don't know how many presentations we've had on attainable uh, attainable housing, um, whatever word we want to use that day. And we still didn't do anything. Okay. So, you know, we need to get doing something because at this time I see that the food banks uh, numbers are going up. They're not going down. Yeah, we might all be nice, warm in our homes, but there's still several families that are not. Okay. So I'm hoping, I hope we, we can really do something in my eighth year of being on council and see some movement in this area. Yeah. I hope that the Ridge Homes discussion keeps moving forward. I didn't Sounds hear like much from yeah. that, but we need to stay on it and not let it go. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like a good I live around some housing I thought Jefferson County owns up on 58th and Ward. I have no issue. There's no problems coming off the property. Mm -hmm. There's not those people. In fact, the, the kids and families that come out of there are great contributors to our community. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've all lived in some circumstances or another. So I really take a hard offense to when people say those people yeah, because too. we were all there. <clears throat> at one point or another in life, either being the bachelor like him, renting, or a young family when I grew up with a single mom. Right. So um, let's keep working, the, working this and, and getting this thing going, and I look to staff to hopefully start producing some movement in this topic. Good. Okay, well, I think you all can see why I thought it was important that we bring this forward and have this discussion. Susan, I appreciate your... Uh, your expertise, it's obvious in this arena. I, I agree with Ms. Miller, your, uh, your frankness and directness is something we need to hear as well. It gets me uh, in trouble sometimes yeah, too, by well, the way. It's okay. But, like you said, you don't have to get elected. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to get but elected. It's, uh, it's useful for us. I, I would say that to staff, and, and I know parking is always going to be an issue, but I think we need to look at some of our projects, and I know that uh, Maureen and her folks have done some analysis with some of our city staff in terms of the parking ratios in some of our existing projects. If we could get some constructive feedback in terms of how those parking ratios are actually working and whether or not we have problems in those neighborhoods with, you know, we've got test cases out there to be able to look at in terms of, because those parking ratios are far below the 2.2 that we're requiring right now. And I think we've got to, as part of this discussion, at least look at that. 
I love the discussion of doing a, a, a market study, and I appreciate, Susan, you bringing forward folks who can, who can help us with that, that. Uh, as the necessary next step, uh, if everybody on council's good with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank Mr. You. Devin, does that give you sufficient direction for tonight? Yes. Very good. And I do want to thank the people in the audience who are here on, on this specific topic. Um, you've been coming to us for quite some time. We have heard you. We recognize that it's, uh, it's it, not unlike the topic we're going to be coming up with next. It's something that we need to have more discussion on and we can't just kick the can down the road. So with that, why don't we take a very quick uh, stand in place and then we will reconvene for our second workshop item.
Okay, everybody, we're going to reconvene if we could. It's nice to see our citizens in healthy discussion as we were doing some of that up here ourselves. So with that, Mr. Devin, we'll let you uh, kick off the second workshop. We, we kind of went with uh, non-controversial, easy stuff tonight. So I really, you know, I really appreciate that. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we're going to have a presentation on waste hauling by Randy Mormon uh, as part of the Arvada Sustainability Advisory Committee. Very good. Good evening, Mayor Williams and members of the Arvada City Council. Again, my name is Randy Mormon, a member of the Arvada Sustainability Advisory Committee. And with me today is Tara Ray Kent, also a member who will be presenting with me. Um, I'd like to take one moment to ask all of the members of the Sustainability Committee to stand. They're with us tonight. I'm going to have them introduce themselves really quick for you. Great. Thank, Thank you for you. being here and for your hard work. Well, tonight we're going to present to you our research that we've been doing over the last year and a half um, on our current waste hauling system and make a recommendation that the City Council consider changing our waste hauling system to an organized hauling system. Our current system is an unorganized open market system, which means the city directs residents who are not living in HOAs to a list of 11 haulers on the uh, city website. And residents then have to find their own hauler um, and, and go on from there. We have concluded based on our research that this is an inefficient and costly system for us. A street could have on average 17 trucks or more traveling up and down it per week if all the haulers provide recycling every other week. This inefficiency results in higher costs to our residents, whom we have found are paying more than HOAs and neighboring communities. Residents are also have to pay more to get recycling services, and that then discourages many residents from recycling. Under the current system, the city is also unable to provide popular services the residents want, like leaf pickup, bulky item pickup, and electronics recycling. We know that with more trucks on the city's roads, we have increased road damage, more air pollution, noise, and safety risks. So therefore, our recommendation tonight is the, for the city to change to an organized waste hauling system, one where the city contracts with one or more haulers to service either the entire city or a portion of the city. This would result in having only one trash truck and one recycling truck on each street. And that brings us to our slogan, one street, one truck, one Arvada. We believe an organized waste hauling system will do the following. Lower the cost to residents, provide additional services, decrease road maintenance costs, improve health and safety, and finally help us as a city reach our performance metric of recycling and composting 35% of our waste by 2019. We're here today because our committee, the Arvada Sustainability Advisory Committee, wants to improve our city's recycling. We are recycling 13% of our waste we produce according to a 2011 residential hauling study. Keep in mind that the national average is 35%. The biggest barrier to recycling in Arvada is a lack of convenience. From our study, we know that 60% of Arvadans don't have a recycling bin at their house. And we know our Vadans want to recycle and often then have to pay more to get that extra service. They have to pay more than those who produce a lot of trash and don't recycle. Non-HOA residents have to go out of their way to find a hauler that offers recycling and then add it to their waste service, often paying more. And this provides that inconvenience that I mentioned. The solution then is what we call an organized hauling system. And the biggest difference that we have found between Arvada and leading recycling cities across the country is that these other cities have an organized hauling system. 70% of the communities across the country have organized hauling system. 
100 communities in Colorado have an organized hauling system. It means that they either contract with haulers or the city itself provides its own hauling or has its own trucks. And they provide curbside recycling in bundled, which is included in with their waste service. Residents therefore automatically get a recycle cart with their trash cart. It's convenient and we find more people participate. It's that simple. Cities with curbside recycling end up collecting 100 pounds more recycling per household per year than cities that require their residents to subscribe to their own recycling service. And one example here nearby is the city of Lafayette found its recycling rate almost doubled when they changed to an organized hauling system. We've also found that our current system does not meet our community's demand for service. We conducted a survey in 2015, the city did a citizen survey, and it showed that more than 90% of our Vada residents want more recycling options. We know now that Sustainability, a local nonprofit organization, is now charging residents for single stream recycling drop-off, thus making it even less convenient for residents without curbside service. Residents want leaf pickup in the fall when, when, when we have to rake our leaves. And during this past November, our leaf collection, the city saw a record number of residents participating in that. I think we all remember back to May 2017 when we offered a free recycling event for electronics, mattresses, and other hard to recycle items, and we had to close five days early, a week earlier than we had planned due to the high demand from residents. This event cost the city over $106,000. After 2015, the city could no longer find a hauler to contract for large item pickup because it is too costly to the hauler to pull trucks from their other routes. These once a year pickups for large items cost the city $346,000 back in 2015 when we ended that program. So why does organized hauling provide more service at a lower cost? Well, it all has to do with economies of scale. The cost of the truck and the driver is the same for the hauler, whether they pick up for one home or for every home on the block. Let's just assume for a minute that it costs $10 per minute per truck to collect trash. The most expensive inefficiency for the hauler then is driving to and fro, or the windshield time. In other words, it costs dollars to get a truck to the customers and pennies then to service them. The way to lower the cost for the hauler and the resident then is to increase density. So when we look at our current system, in many cases, again in non-HOA areas, haulers pick up from fewer homes on a given block and therefore then charge each home a higher rate than if the same hauler picked up from every home on the block. Haulers then have to charge extra for recycling as that requires an additional truck to come and pick up recycling from those few homes that request it. This higher cost in hauling and recycling then is what discourages residents from recycling. And if you look at the slide here, we have two examples we're comparing. The top one is our current system where the hauler is picking up, and this is just an example, of five homes out of seven on this block. It costs the hauler, again, just a simple model here, let's say $10, um, as we mentioned, per minute. So it's about $70 for the total cost to the hauler to drive down that block and pick up from those five homes. The cost per resident then is $14 because there's only five homes on that block that are paying for that service from that one hauler. If we move to an organized hauling system, then you divide that cost among that same cost, the $70 for the hauler to pick up for that street, you divide that cost among all seven of those homes and that reduced the cost for each home. And here in the model, it would be $10 per home. So we did some research, and again, this was um, under the direction that you had given us as your advisory committee to look at and compare what is happening in our VADA with our prices. And we surveyed homes in non-HOA areas, we surveyed homes in HOAs, and we found a pretty significant difference. Those homes in non-HOAs, we were paying between $20 and $29 per month, and that is for both trash and recycling. In HOA households, for both trash and recycling, they were paying between $8 and $15 per month. HOAs can get a better rate simply because of the economy of scale. 
They coordinate trash service with one company and get better rates than individual residents can. The haulers then can charge less by spreading the cost over all the homes in the HOAs. Now the same is even more true for cities with organized hauling. They can bundle services or provide more services at a lower cost to the resident. And on the slide here, we have a comparison with Golden, one of our neighbors. And they not only have trash and recycling, but also provide yard waste pickup. And they're paying between $6.20 to $20 per month. Now, I will make a note that that range in Golden is due to the fact that they have a volume-based pricing system, or pay as you throw, which means that if a homeowner subscribes to the smallest trash can, they're paying $6.20 a month. If they subscribe to the largest, tra largest trash can, they're paying $20 per month. So they're paying for the amount of trash they send in the landfill, just like we do for other utilities, whether it's water or electricity, we pay for the amount that we use. And that is the system that, that our uh, Golden is going with, and that's why you see that range in their prices. So with our unorganized open market system, I want to make the case to you tonight that we are not providing the lowest prices through competition. We hear from some residents that they like to have a choice in their hauler and like to have competition for the service to get the lowest rates. The problem is that our unorganized market system does not truly function as an open competitive market for the residents or consumers. Costs are not transparent. It's not like going to Walmart and Target and comparing prices and then deciding where you're going to go to buy your product. There's no place for us as a resident to look and compare those rates between the different haulers and make our choice. Also, a resident could be paying more than their neighbor for the same service from the same hauler simply because that, their neighbor threatened to switch haulers and the hauler then offered a lower price. You also could be the sixth home on the street to be added on that service for that hauler, and therefore the, off, the hauler offers you a lower price, but keeps the same price, the higher price, for the other neighbors on the block. We end up with what I would call a flawed and inequitable pricing system. If we look at older neighborhoods that are non-HOA areas, there are many haulers servicing the same area and residents end up having to pay twice as much for their waste service as those that live in newer HOA areas. And again, that's due to the inefficiency of having several haulers and the diseconomies of scale. It's very possible that those residents who argue to have an open hauling system because they want to have free choice and think they are getting the best price are actually paying the highest prices in our community. And residents who choose to do the right thing, recycle, pay the higher price for the service. Now from a poli policy perspective, the consequences of our current system is that we are rewarding those who produce more waste and don't recycle. And we're charging those who are producing less waste and are recycling. And also consider that there are residents who have lower incomes, don't have a lot of money, and they would like to recycle but aren't able to because they can't afford it. So again, that is a flawed and equitable pricing system that we currently have for our community. Now just to drive the point home on the differences, I live in an HOA, and Tara doesn't, and I pay $10.46 per month for trash and recycling. Tara gets the same service, and she pays $23 per month for trash and recycling. So I'm going to let Tara take it from here. So what's the solution? organized hauling that offers better and more equitable services at a better price. Residents living in cities with contracted systems such as Decano, Edgewater, Frederick, Golden, Lafayette, Louisville, and Sheridan, and also cities with municipal systems, Longmont, Loveland, North Glen, and Thornton, pay less than Arvadans in non-HOAs and they get more service. All of them get recycling at no extra charge. Most get yard waste pickup and bulky waste pickup. We didn't include cities like Denver because waste service is paid through their general fund and it's not charged separately to each resident. So in Arvada, residents who don't live in HOAs can't get prices comparable to an HOA. They either have to move into an HOA, pay a higher price, or move out of Arvada completely. So Randy's going to hand out the City of Lakewood study now that's shown on the slide. The City of Lakewood conducted 
a study comparing prices of other cities with contracted and municipal systems. And our table shown here summarizes these data. Some of these cities do not charge additional fees for yard waste and large item pickup based on their contract with their hauler. But most of these cities are able to offer these popular services under their contracts that we're not able to offer under our current system. A citywide or a district-wide contract can provide services to all residents at equitable prices. An organized hauling system can include additional services like yard waste, large item pickup or bulky waste, as part of these overall waste fees. This alleviates the city from having to try to find a contractor to provide the additional services separately from waste hauling or find money in the city budget for these additional services. So we do want to emphasize the ability to dispose of yard waste easily, which includes leaf pickup that the city currently pays for. So currently there's no place for residents to take the organic waste besides the two Saturdays in November a year. And this only includes the leaves, it doesn't include branches. Organic debris collection, which includes tree branches and shrubs and leaves and household kitchen compost, is a requested and sought after service that none of the 11 waste haulers currently offer. So the current system is inefficient and it results in significant additional costs to the city in terms of road damage and street repair costs. A street could have on average 17 trucks or more traveling up and down it per week if all the haulers provided recycling every other week. Each trash truck equates to 1,000 to 1,400 vehicles per day in the terms of road damage. And this is because they are heavy and they make frequent stops. The city of Fort Collins determined that 20% of their road damage is caused by trash truff, truck traffic. So more trucks equal more air pollution and noise and um, pollution and increased safety risks to our residents. Both neighborhoods and business areas experience truck noise from engines, backing alarms, and sounds from these dumping materials. The safety of our children, pets, and residents is threatened with more trucks on our street. So most of you have seen this graphic before. This is a map of my neighborhood trash map. And of the 14 homes depicted, there are six hauling companies. Five of us choose to pay more to recycle, and that adds three more trucks every other week. So now you're totaling nine trash trucks on our week or every other week, um, and I live on a dead end street. So these nine trucks don't just drive by once, they drive to the end of the street and they turn around and they drive back. And this is on a 600 foot stretch of a local Arvada street. And I don't think I'm an isolated instance. So what's the solution? Organized hauling. According to the City of Fort Collins 2008 trash study that I just rec um, request or, uh, mentioned before, the city estimates that $170,000 of savings each year from reduced road damage if the city changed to an organized hauling system. So the City of Arvada's own 2011 residential hauling study reported an 82% reduction in trash truck traffic with a change to an organized hauling system. So we listened to you, City Council and Mayor, and we started our own residential education campaign. Over the last few years, the Arvada Sustainability Advisory Committee has made presentations to groups. We've tabled at numerous community events, and we've spoke before City Council and to individual council members. This slide shows the highlights of these presentations and discussions. We've educated folks on how our waste system works in Arvada and how we can improve it. We ask residents to sign a letter to Mayor Williams and the City Council asking y'all to look into improving our residential waste collection system. And today we present you with that letter and 508 signatures. Thank you. So it was through these conversations with the community that we got to this recommendation for an improved waste hauling system. What we've heard from these residents voicing their concerns over is increases in prices with their current haulers and they constantly have to change haulers. Many new residents moving in from other communities are shocked to find out that we don't have recycling as part of our waste service. And they have to pay more than they paid elsewhere. Also, many residents have complained of high volumes of trucks on their streets, voicing concerns about potholes, safety, noise, and air pollution. 
Additionally, many residents would like to have made available yard waste pickup, bulky item pickup, and hard to recycle materials such as electronics. So what has resulted from the education campaign and the public dialogue? Well, the times have changed since this issue became before City Council seven years ago. And many new residents have moved into Arvada who want easy, convenient recycling. And they don't want to hassle with different haulers, and they want a lower cost for more service. So in summary, waste is the third highest mentioned topic on the new site, Speak Up Arvada. Numerous conversations about waste and recycling are on the Facebook group, Our Nevada Neighbors, and also on Nextdoor frequently. We have collected 508 signatures supporting organized waste hauling. 67% of Arvada residents either somewhat or strongly support a single hauler trash and recycling system in the 2017 survey. And this is a 2017 Arvada Citizen Survey, and just to clarify, it was a differently poised question the 2015 survey that I mentioned previously. Um, so we got an answer of 90% on that survey and 67% on this survey. So we've talked a lot to the public over the past year and a half, and we've taken a lot of those comments and the research that we've done and put that into our recommendation to you today. We have an opportunity to improve our waste hauling system it can be a win-win situation. The city improves its recycling rate because recycling is made more convenient. Every resident gets a recycling cart automatically. It is bundled in with their waste hauling. Residents win when companies compete to offer the lowest price. For waste service, the best method to drive the, this competition is when the city puts out a contract for trash and recycling. It creates a transparent process where the haulers directly compete with each other to offer the best service for the lowest price. It also creates a more efficient system where the cost of the hauling can be spread across every household and the hauler then can offer a much lower price per household. Just like other utilities, the best way to get the best price on trash service is to provide services to every household. All residents are then treated fairly. It doesn't matter where they live, they are paying a lower price and getting similar service. Residents also will be getting additional services that they want, yard waste pickup, bulky item pickup, electronics recycling, and other hard to recycle materials collection. The city also gets the added benefit of reduced road maintenance costs, reduced air pollution and noise, and improved safety on our streets. We're committed to working, to continue to work and organize in the community to provide support. We've been doing this, we're asking you to work with us now to take the next step forward. And that next step is a request for proposal. The first step is to put out an RFP, and this is to gather more information so the city can make the right decision about cost and services. An RFP allows the haulers to put forth their best offers so the city can determine what is best for residents based on different scenarios of service and costs. The RFP does not lock the city into any decision. It only provides more information for making a good decision. We recommend the RFP include the following elements. One, bi-weekly recycling collection. Two, an option to contract with one company or divide the city into zones. If the city decides to divide into zones and contract with several haulers, the city can offer to award one of the districts to a small or local hauler, or can give additional points to the small or local hauler. And small haulers can also subcontract with other haulers to compete with the larger haulers. I know there is concern about the small hauler not being able to compete with the larger haulers, but I want you to also keep in mind that the trend has been Unfortunately, the smaller haulers are getting bought out every day by larger haulers, regardless of the hauling system. And just recently, Waste Connections bought out American Disposal. Um, and so there's a lot of consolidating that's happening in the hauling industry. We also want to include in the request for proposal optional yard debris and or food waste composting collection, because again, we know that's something that members of the community want. Bulky item pickup for furniture, electronics, or other hard to recycle materials. And I think it's smart for us to start by excluding HOAs from the RFP, but allowing them to opt in later. 
We've heard from some HOAs and they want to keep the hauler that they have and they're getting recycling and um, trash service at a lower price and they're getting good service. So we can exclude them from the contract but allow them to opt in later. And we found that other cities have done this and have found that many HOAs do decide to opt in later because the city's organized system has lower rates than they are offering and again provides more services like yard waste pickup and bulky item pickup that the HOA's residents also want. Finally, we recommend for the RFP to make sure that residents continue to see low rates. That's one of the biggest complaints we hear under our current system is the rates keep changing and keep going up and it's hard for residents to have to keep calling around and trying to find another hauler at a lower rate. So we recommend that the contract be for five years and the first two years have the price locked in for our residents. The contract can then allow for an increase in price based on the consumer price index after that. This allows increase in costs that are occurred to the hauler over time, but also does not allow the hauler to then gouge the resident. We look forward to working with you on improving our waste system and hope you will consider our recommendation to move forward with putting out an RFP so that we can look at an organized hauling system for the city. We thank you for your time and we are more than happy to take your questions. Very good. Thank you for the presentation. Obviously, you guys have put a lot of time and energy and effort into this. Uh, you have indeed followed up on what City Council asked you to do, to go out, do your research, do the education, and we certainly thank you for that. I know you've got some advocates on Council uh, and that uh, we have some discussions we need to have. Are there specific questions anybody has at this point? Ms. Ford. Randy, as I was um, looking at your recommendation, um, one of the things that crossed my mind was uh, fuel costs. And so I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of costs for waste haulers, what, what is the greatest cost for them? Well, um, I, I, you know, as I presented in the model that I, you know, I said that the, you know, the greatest cost is for actual, the truck and the driver and the time that it takes to drive that truck um, and the fuel cost to, to get to, you know, a street, a particular street. Um, and then the point I was making in the slide was if, you know, if they're picking up three homes or five homes or seven homes, that cost does not change a whole lot depending on how many homes are on that street. It's more about getting to that street. And so the reason why I asked that question is because, um, you know, I'm wondering if, if we were to do a contract, just say in the future, hopefully the near future, um, would, would we, you know, is there a way to uh, keep the prices lower for citizens but if for some reason there should be, you know, something that happens in the economy where, you know, fuel costs go really right. sky high or something like that, whoever knows, you know, um, you, you know, does anybody leave room for some um, negotiation? Right. right. And that's, that's my last bullet point on that, on that slide here is that, mm -hmm. Um, and, and we put this recommendation on based on what we've seen as best practices across the country. And so, you know, concern for both the resident and not having the prices rise too much as I spoke to, and also, you know, thinking about the hauler um, and they have a business to run. So um, that's why we recommended that the first two years are locked in on their prices and they, they calculate that when they put out their RFP. Um, and then allow for an increase in price after that based on the consumer price index. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd just like to make a comment that, um, you know, I grew up in New Jersey for 30 years, and uh, I, I just like to assure um, our residents that there are wonderful cases where you can have a municipal trash hauler. Now, you know, it doesn't have to be a municipal trash hauler, but there is not one instance that I can remember where, you know, my parents who owned the house at the time complained about, you know, prices rising with the haulers. Um, at that time, we even had haulers come to our backyard. We didn't even have to put cans out in the front, which is probably not necessarily the case today. 
but we always got fantastic service um, you know never had a problem right mr. Maria thank you <clears throat> I have a couple of questions so in, in your presentation you listed a whole litany a whole bunch of different things that um, that the single hauler scheme would improve out of all of these what's the one that's the most important to you you know like what's the what uh, if you could only have one of those what what one do you want what do you what do you want out of it <laughs> well again we would we would hope and we are seeing in other communities that we get most of those benefits not just one um, and that's you know that's why we're really proposing this is we're finding that we can get most of those benefits. Right. Well, I guess the question I have is is what's the problem you're trying to s solve? Just ranked in order? Is it recycling rate? Is it the the cost to citizens for trash hauling? Is it street damage? Is it you know what 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 is what's the problem you want to solve primarily, or what's what's number one on your list of you had five or six? Sure. Years? Well, you know, as I said in our presentation, what brought us here today is our concern for our recycling rate. Um, and we have one of the lowest rates in the front range in the city of Arvada. So I think as a resident, I think that there's a lot we could be doing to improve that. And when we look at what other cities have done to, to make that effort, you know, a lot of people talk about education and talk about different things that need to be done. And, and education, quite frankly, does not move the needle. Um, you know, you have to do education with something else. You have to change the system. You have to make it more convenient for people. Um, and that's what we have found, that the more convenience of it and having a bin, just like you have a trash bin, how easy it is to put out your trash, you know, once a week, the same type of convenience with recycling really does improve the recycling rate. And you have to do education along with that. Um, but you know, we have found that education won't do it alone. And so this is, you know, moving to a system where everyone has a recycling bin and looking at what the different options are out there to get everyone a bin, having a contract with a hauler or several haulers like in a district system is the best way to get the lowest price and, and most, the uh, greatest amount of service. Okay. So, so what other ways are there to improve the recycling rate, you know, you mentioned education, right. that's not very effective, but, but there's got to be something between these, between education and this. What, yes. what are the other things that other places have employed or had success so, with, tried? What, what are the so the other options do? that we have available, you could look at the city of Longmont and the city of Denver, where it's all tax-based and they pay for their service that way. Um, and they have their own hauling system. So they have their own trucks. So we could look at having our own trucks and providing that service so that you know, it's unified and everybody gets the service through the city. Um, the other one is like the city of Boulder and the city of Fort Collins where they kept an open market system, but they passed an ordinance. And they said, if you are going to have, be a hauler in our city, you have to provide trash and recycling. In the city of Boulder, they also say you have to provide composting as well to every resident. Now, we are not recommending that, and the reason is because they have one of the highest prices in the state for those services. Because again, you lose that efficiency of scale that I talked about. Okay. Any, anything else, or any other any other approaches to improve the recycling rate? Well, the the other one that I know that is very effective, and I would suggest that that we look at um, as well as we move when we move through an RFP is looking at the volume-based pricing that I mentioned that Golden has and, and many other cities in Colorado and across the country have. That is very effective at in increasing your recycling rate as well. But, but that's predicated on having a single hauler. You can't Having a system you where you can system. have that everyone has, or you know, Boulder and Fort Collins have pay as you throw as well, but again, that's all by ordinance. Right, okay. Um, so, Tell me a little bit about some of these other communities that have organized waste hauling. How do they handle customer service issues? So if I'm a citizen in one of those other places that's, let's say, not a municipal-owned trash service but that contracts with somebody else, um, how do, and, and I come home and my trash cans are knocked over and trash is spilled all over and it was trash day and there's no trash truck to be found, who do those residents call and who deals with it? In most cases, they're calling directly to the hauler. 
that's on contract, and that's part of that contract that the city has that the, the hauler provides the customer service. Right. And what is the customer's recourse if the hauler says, ah, we're sorry, we'll catch you next week? Well, then they would, you know, obviously they want to first talk to the hauler and ask for, you know, improvement there, and if it's not happening, then they would come to the city and, and, and voice their concern, and, and the city's the one who has the contract with the hauler, so the city would need to communicate that to the hauler, that there's a problem. Okay. And do, do any of these other cities have, that have organized recycling, do they take a cut off the top to provide those services, or is that just folded into the expense of the overhead or expense of the city, or how does that work within those con contractual arrangements? I think that can vary from city to city, and I think that could be up to the city and how they want to arrange that. Do, do some cities do that? Do they actually take a, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know how you, I don't know contractually how you'd call that, but whether they get a, uh, a, a piece of it or a percentage or a, a share back or I don't know what you right. call it, but. Um, I'm going to defer that to, I know, sorry? Franchise fee. Franchise fee, and that's part of the contract? Yeah. Okay, so some cities have a franchise fee type of arrangement. And in the cities with organized waste hauling, who bills for the waste hauling? Who's got the burden of billing and collecting? Um, I believe in most cases it's the city itself, is that correct? If the city has a, if the city already currently bills for utilities, right. then the utility could be or it can be billed individually by law. Right, so it can be either way again. And, and what do most of them do? do are, are they 50-50, or how do, how do cities tend to, how does that fall out? How does that get split out? I don't know offhand. I mean, I could look into it unless. Right, okay. I only have one city that we actually will. Okay. Okay. So mostly the cities bill for it. And I assume, again, a franchise fee or something like that would go to pay for that service that the city provides? Okay. Um, and, and I would assume then it'd be like any other utility, if a resident doesn't pay, they just get skipped until they do pay. Is that the, is that the way it goes? Okay, very well, yes. Okay. Do, do any of these other cities that have organized uh, hauling allow residents to opt out? You know, most do not. There are a few that have, um, and I'm aware of one in Indiana that, that has done that. Um, but overall, most do not. And it's just like your HOAs, I can't opt out of my HOA fee. I don't know if anybody else can, but um, you know, it's it's it, it, the, in most cases that is not available. Yeah, but you can opt out out of XL if you want. You can opt out of the city water. Hard, uh -huh. hard to opt out of the city sewer unless you were here a long time ago and have a working septic right. system. But right. but you can opt out. Right. Okay. Um, Just from a contractual, and, and maybe this might be the question for, for Mark, how do you contractually, maybe the city attorney wants to weigh in on this, how do you contractually treat HOAs different from individual residents? You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna say to an individual resident, you're no longer allowed to contract for your waste hauler with who you want, but you as an HOA, as a different entity, you're allowed to contract with anybody that you want. How does that is, that, is there any concerns about that? Is there problems with that? Well, that's actually, that's what the situation is now, right? So if you're in an HOA, you're, you're, paying, your, uh, annu uh, you're paying your monthly fees to the HOA, and they're providing certain services, including the trash hauling. And if you're not in an HOA, unless you're separately contracting, you're not getting that service, and you're actually contracting with individual haulers to, for whatever services that you want. Well, right, I understand that. I'm talking about it a little bit differently. I'm talking about the HOA as an entity under the presentation we just saw here, who HOAs would get to contract with any waste hauler they want to handle the waste hauling for that HOA, but yet an individual homeowner would no longer be allowed to contract with who they wanted. Well, I think that that's, uh, I think that's really the essence of the question, isn't it? Because it gets into whether as a policy matter, council wants to enter into that sort of an ordinance that would make that requirement. Right. But I guess my question is, from a legal perspective, are there legal problems with that type of? I don't of think a that there's legal problems. A, I think it's I think setup. it's an ordinance that that other cities have done, and so, it's, it's just a matter of 
policy decision that council's making right. on that. So that's a power that cities actually mm -hmm. do have. Okay. Okay. And then Tara, I have a quick question for you. So I like that map of your street. It probably looks very much like my street, only I'm not on a, de on a uh, dead end street. But have you talked to your neighbors about, hey, why don't we get together and in yes. reduce this from six to two or six to three or whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, I have a neighbor that I'm in communication. I mean, she's right next door and she's getting a divorce. So she's gonna be on a limited income with as a single mother. And we probably are gonna go in on recycling and trash together. Because mm -hmm. we both don't produce a ton of recycling or a ton of trash. And we know that we can balance our, our waste needs by doing that. Um, we haven't talked as a whole entire street about doing that. And half of the residents on my street are 20 year plus residents on that street. Um, and some of them like to, they have their hauler and then the neighbors have the same hauler. Um, but no, we haven't talked as a, an entire 14 home group. I mean, it seems like in your case, you have such a compelling case to pick up a clipboard and go to your neighbor and say, hey, let me tell you, let's, let's talk yeah. about the problem, the little micro problem we have here and here's here's the solution that provides all these advantages. And not only that, I bet if we go to a hauler and we say, hey, you get the whole street from here on over, how about cutting us a deal that you might get lower rates too? And I'm just curious, why, why is that not going on anywhere? Why does it take I've government the, to impose that on people? I've heard of discussions on next door of people talking about that in their group, in their community, like in their street areas. I think the bigger question, if that would happen is, how do you decide on a hauler? Some people really want to, you know, waste connections or waste management, and the others want Republic. So how do you decide? You know, I don't want a few, uh, a few in my neighborhood either. We all get along pretty well. Um, so I think that's that's the other question on that. But if this, d depending on how our discussions go this year and next year, maybe that will be an option for us. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Can, can I just ask a, add sure. a comment to that? I think the, the disadvantage to that is you don't have a, like an HOA, you don't have a legal entity to have a contract with a hauler. So, you know, the, the ability to, to negotiate as a group, as an entity, and to really get a great rate and good services, I think is, is much more challenging without that. Yeah. You, you know, in, in my neighborhood, now these are all homes that I own, but I own four houses that I provide trash service to right right around my own home and so I pay for and provide that trash service but I found it really easy to negotiate I pay 39 bucks a quarter per home and so like it was that didn't seem like that was a big hurdle to get $13 a month right. not 20 or 29 right or, you know you know whatever but uh, okay thank you I appreciate it okay. right. Mr. Fiverr so last week, a gentleman named Charles Harrison passed away. He invented the, uh, he worked for Sears, and he invented the trash bin with wheels in the 80s. And so when you talk about the Cadillac. Let's have a moment of silent reflection. Well, first. it's <laughs> factoids when you watch, because he also did the Viewmaster. He yeah. also invented the Viewmaster. Yeah, it was great. Um, but when you talk about the Cadillac service, because when I grew up in Texas, they used to come on the side of the house and carry the metal can all the way out. And the city provided that service. And then... I also know that I think picking your own trash service is actually becoming, uh, it's a weird thing, you know, it's not the norm. The norm is the communities have provided their own service in some form or fashion because even my cousin who moved here from, Se well, the Seattle area, uh, Denver provides all the services through their taxes, right? And uh, when I was dealing, she came to my house and was asking, or I was rolling out trash cans, she's like, wait, wait, so waste management, that's not the city, who's that and why are you doing that? And I've never heard of that. And she's, you know, almost 40 years old and she's never seen where you pick your own trash service ever. And she's traveled the whole United States. So, you know, it's interesting that I get where we were. And when I moved up here, I had no idea that I had to pick my own trash service. And then when I became the HOA president for my small community of 113 homes, um, I've been through this process. So I appreciate the due diligence because it's actually a refreshing, it's the same story, you know, the HOAs deal with the same kind of due diligence you, you've dealt with. But there is a, something to say with uh, negotiating, you know, 113 homes versus a single home. Um, I think we've, we've paid for the last uh, 10 years or 15 years at our HOA sub $8, even with the increases. I got it down to like $3 and some change with waste management um, back 10 years ago. So 
you know, there is a benefit to that. And therefore, the HOA had more money to do other things that it needed to do because we were kind of on a fixed HOA fee. So I appreciate you doing that. So a couple things that I have is when you were out speaking with folks, did you speak to any haulers? Um, about what this could look like and do they want to participate? Right. We've had conversations with haulers. Um, uh, yes, I mean, there are, there are haulers that are interested in, in participating in, in such a competition, I would say. I think you're going to get opinions all across the board on that. And I understand. I mean, it's kind of a lightning rod right. at the end of the day. I mean, at the end, at the, end of the day, it's more of uh, uh, the factors you've listed, I think, that are important for the health of our community. So, and of course, there's just people protecting. Everyone likes or wants Pac-Man or whatever. I don't even know if they're around anymore because I didn't see them listed on your list. But um, are they? Yep. Oh, they are. Um, but you know, all the other different different shops. Um, did you speak at your events to any opponents to your idea? And what did they say? Yes, we had a few, um, and it was interesting in that. Was, was, um, was John, <laughs> he only he only owns half the city, so of course he gets a good deal. <laughs> um, you know, and I, and I used that example in the presentation about Walmart and Target because that was one that a person said, you know, well, I really like to be able to have the competition, you know, and and have the choice based on that, and that's when I really got to thinking about. You know, how does our system work and is it really just like going, you know, to shop at Walmart and Target? And it's not because we can't see those prices. They're not transparent. We have to call around and do all the work and the research and, and compare prices on our own. And again, those prices may not be the same for what our neighbor is paying and what I'm paying from the same hauler. And so it's, it's really a different kind of situation and it's not nearly as simple as just going and looking at prices at Walmart or Target. Right. I, I, I agree with that. I, you know, because I think uh, there, there is going to, there are, I think our community is going through a transition, you know, demographically. Um, and so I think maybe the timing is interesting to, to continue this conversation. Uh, about acquiring customers, um, did you think through the process in which uh, folks would uh, participate in this program? Did you think that it would be an ordinance and all of a sudden everyone in non HOAs converted? <laughs> or do we, turn around and say, hey, if you're interested, opt in. Mm. The city has it at $6 a month, right. and you can opt in, and, and we'll bill you through your water bill. So, I mean, what was the envision of how yeah, to acquire so, customers? So the challenge on opt-in is that in order for a hauler to put in a bid and an RFP, they really need to know how many homes are they going to be serving you know, to give you a good price and give you a good estimate on what they're going to charge and what kind of services they can provide. So that is really the challenge if you're going to try an opt-in system is you really need to guarantee to the hauler from day one, this is how many homes they're going to have to start. Um, or, and so th or provide them an opportunity to say, I will acquire so many homes within the first 12 months. I mean, because I think the price from 113 homes to even 500 homes, I don't think the price moves too much um, right. at the end of the day. Uh, I can't envision them saying that it would swing way down low, you know. I think if you give them a vision to say, look, we as a city would pr promote, you know, acquiring a thousand households per year for five years or something to that effect. I just, I, I right. fear, I fear one coming over with a uh, heavy hand on it is not going to get the results we want. Um, I think that if you show the cost benefit mm -hmm. to folks and give them the option um, to convert over time, but or any right. new residents. But let's think through the acquiring of customers. To be fair, not only to the trash hole, uh, uh, haulers, but to our citizens. Uh, you know, as we if we continue down this path, we have an opportunity to to think about that. You know, um, and and I would use uh, the water bill. You know, us doing the billing and us picking up some stuff as negotiation uh, perspectives. If I used my business development hat on that, I some of the services or things that the city could pick up should be leveraged in reducing the price on the hauler side. So, you know, those are kind of things that uh, as we, if we progress on this or how we progress on it, those are, let's just keep on the T's and C's of how, who does what, and that should do the rate costs. And, and speaking of that too, I think there's something important to make note of, and that is that the, um, Recycling Partnership is an organization countrywide that is really trying to provide grants to communities like ours to get more recycling. And what they're providing grants for is the purchase of recycled carts. 
um, and so they could provide, if we decide to change our system in a way, they could come in here and give us the money to provide recycling carts for every single home. Um, and that really helps when you're putting out that RFP with the haulers because it, it helps for it. when you're concerned about the small hauler, for example, that investment in that infrastructure they cannot make and so they can't necessarily compete with the larger haulers and so that helps level that playing field because now yeah. you're saying that the city is gonna provide those carts and own them and so you can do that through that type of grant and it also helps when you go to, after that five years of that first contract and move on to the second, the original contract owner doesn't have an, a leg up on the others that could compete the second time around because they don't own the infrastructure of the carts, the, the carts. city does. And that's what we found has been very successful in other cities who have, have most recently in Colorado uh, made these types of changes that they own the carts. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a, that, keep that innovative spirit because I think that that's where you need to be when we get into the negotiations or wherever we end up going next. But those are kind of the, the innovative approaches you have to have to, one, help out everyone. And I, I would encourage that it's a win-win-win, a win for industry, a win for the city, and a win for the constituents and consumers at the end of the day. And I, and I think that there is a win-win-win, and we just need to get there at the end of the day. And I think uh, I've... Uh, what I do every day is a little bit different, but um, you can find the three wins at the end of the day. One other thing I'd like to put to staff is, I wonder if, because we're in a non-attainment area for uh, air quality, I wonder if uh, the uh, Colorado Air Quality CMAC funds could be applied to, to help, if, if we were to pursue this any further, to help you know, pay for some of our expenses or associated expenses to implementing such a program because there would be a reduce uh, in air quality. I think we'd have to research that to know for sure, but I think it's a possibility. Yeah, I think it's something that we can also, so grant, I think it's another, right? And CMAQ's been a hard thing to find that we can spend money on. I mean, shoot, CMAQ paid for fiber, so you keep that in mind too. But at the end of the day, we should always look at those, those grants. So that's all I have, but a great idea, good job. Thank you very much for all you guys coming out here. Yeah, you Mr. McGough. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for a very, uh, informative presentation and uh, very well uh, presented to us and thanks to the entire committee for working on this. Uh, the, uh, the scars that I have from 2011 have <laughs> nearly healed up and are getting <laughs> less visible all the time. So I think it's time to take a look at this uh, uh, once again. Um, I think that the, the concept of the, the single hauler is uh, is upon us. I think we need to uh, proceed uh, with it. Um, Mr. Pfeiffer has asked about certain operational issues, etc. I would uh, suggest that those might yet uh, be worked out. Um, the only thing I would have to say is you've indicated the next step is the re request for proposal. I would suggest that the next step may be further outreach to the community, um, further uh, information of the gathering by the uh, by city staff and by the uh, by the council, and perhaps it's a request for, as they call it. Sometimes there's a request for information from various vendors. Sometimes there's a request for qualifications. The request for a proposal suggests that everything is specified down to, you know very definite terms in order that somebody can, it's bid ready. And I think there's information that needs to be gained before that, perhaps through a little different process, but that's something that can be worked out. But I'd like to say that uh, I would be very supportive of moving ahead with a uh, proposal uh, for single hauler. So thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Ms. Miller. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your presentation. I appreciate you. So I had so many answers that I wanted to answer Mr. Marriott at the time that he was asking questions. I'll refrain from all of them except for one. I would submit that um, making recycling mandatory might increase the rates that we have here in Arvada. Yes. Many of these guys know, they've heard me up here before saying, I lived in New Hampshire where it was live free or die, no rules, recycling was mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> True. This is true. Hey, did you see that football game on Sunday? Oh, did you see that Broncos game? Oh. <laughs> okay. So, where was I? 
<laughs> we have seen the results now of two citizen surveys since I have been on council, two. And our citizens have told us twice now that we, they want more recycling, they want better recycling, and um, better options for um, their trash. And I've been through this conversation more than once. I was your chamber president when, when Mr. McGough and many others were getting literally their lives threatened up here um, for even considering a single hauler. And we were Switzerland down at the chamber building with the trash haulers in the room saying, let's be nice and everybody stop, relax. And then I was also working with the Westminster Chamber of Commerce just recently when they were considering single hauler two years ago. And um, I will tell you that we had the votes on council to pass that and then it got pushed. The football got passed down into election season. Go with the football theme. Passed down into election season and then the waffling began and then we lost the votes because it was election season. So coming up on an election season, this is why I bring this up, I would very much like to see this council absolutely pass an ordinance for one street, one truck, one Arvada at 100%. Um, I, I'm nervous that as we get into an election year, I'm nervous. I feel like we've got the votes right now to do that. Tonight, could we get this? Could we do this Monday, next Monday? <laughs> All right. If we can't do it next Monday, and if we couldn't pass this before the election season got hot and heavy, I would really like to see us put it on the ballot to let the voters decide. They've told us, right? We've asked them twice. And I would submit to you that if we're not going to listen to our voters, then we need to stop asking them what they want to hear. So. Mr. Jones. Was that a mic drop? That was a mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get fired up often. Oh, baloney. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm at a loss for words now. Uh, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, so since a couple of folks have shared kind of their growing up experience, my growing up was, no, my dad bought an old <laughs> Mountain Bell van that he kept off to the side of the house, and that was the trash container. We'd open up the sliding door and we'd throw it in there, and then once a month I got to get in there with my dad and drive to the landfill, and we got rid of our trash that way. So things have changed um, over the last... A lot of recycling with that. Yes, oh, yes. there was no recycling <laughs> with that. Um, but no, I mean, it's obviously lots, of, lots has changed. Um, with regard, so Dot mentioned Westminster. I was curious um, what conversations you had with other municipalities like Westminster or Lakewood um, with regard to the struggles that they had um, in their councils and the decisions that they made. That's a great question, and we certainly have been um, communicating with them and watching their activities as well. Um, I first, speak to the Westminster uh, situation. You know, I, I think we on the committee really observed that and learned from that. I think there were a lot of lessons that we took from that experience, and, and that was, quite frankly, in my opinion, they didn't do their homework as far as in the community goes. And that's what we've been doing, you know, for our city over the past year and a half, is we've been doing our homework. We've been talking to folks, we've been educating them. And I think that was really a missing piece in, in, in this in Westminster situation. Um, and so I think you just had a lot of misinformation and people not really understanding, you know, what was going on when they went through that process. And it really got more and more compli complicated and convoluted. And, so they went down the road, uh, you know, through that RFP process. And so we're really working hard to try to prevent some of those mistakes um, here in our community. And I think that we've done a, a really good job of, of reaching out in the community and talking about this issue. Yeah, no, you certainly have. Um, and, and so I appreciate that. So on the 13% um, the recycle rate, <clears throat> did you say that that was based off of a 2011 study? That is correct. So there's been seven years or so is there a chance that maybe it's better than 13 percent? Oh, there's certainly a chance. We just don't have the data. How um, often do they do those studies? That's really up to the city. That was a city, oh, that was a city, city? effort. So it's, you know, it's when we oh, okay. put forward that kind of study. So we just haven't done it since then. So I'm just curious, uh, Mr. Devin, do we have plans to do another survey with regards to I that? Would, I would suggest that we have to be directed by council. You know, the, the, the marching orders that have been given to me since 2011 is don't touch this issue. 
<laughs> Fair enough. Saying, I'm just saying. And, so that study was done in conjunction with Mr. McGough's battle at, wounds. At, at, at yeah. mine. Yeah. Yes, and yeah, and, I'll and just several. Jump in. That study um, cost us about fifty-seven thousand dollars, and it was part of our overall energy efficiency block grant that we had at the time. And so we did extensive surveying and outreach in the community through that study and understanding where we've had growth in the community, which has been a lot of HOAs in the past seven years, understanding the traditional neighborhoods in Arvada and the waste hauling practices have not changed that much in the past seven years. Um, so at this point, I don't think the committee's recommendation would be to do another study, which is that's why they didn't recommend that. We've certainly spoken about it, um, but it wouldn't be the best use of our resources at this point. Um, also, Gleaning Lakewood just um, spent money on doing a study, and we've been met with their staff. Their staff's come to the committee meetings, and their um, study and Westminster study that have been done more recently in the past couple are reflective of the same situation in Arvada. So is it, is it possible that because of the studies, their initiatives didn't pass? That's where I'm, that's where I'm a little confused because mm -hmm. they did this, so Westminster did a study and it went down through an election season. Lakewood's done a study and they've struggled. Um, I w I'm sorry, I would interject that Lakewood is kind of on the same track that we currently okay. are. They're, they're really you know, evaluating this now and, and, and looking at it pretty hard. So I consider them almost on the same track as we are no, now, I from appreciate my understanding. It. Okay, yeah. that's good. I was thinking they were in a different place, but you probably have better in intel on that, so thanks. Um, uh, uh, several of these have, have been answered. Um, you, know, I, you know, I guess the reality is, is and I think when I met with, with you individually, I think you guys cornered me in a room anyway. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's effective. Um, you know, like I said, I live in an HOA too. And so this really, honestly, is just not top of mind because I have one hauler. I live in a, in a, in a one street, one truck, one Arvada type scenario. And so there's one trash truck and there's one recycle truck that comes down my street every Friday, or I'm sorry, every Monday now. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm oblivious to kind of what's going on in those other areas, but I certainly uh, understand um, why it works, because I live in it. Um, so with that, and I know that uh, somebody asked you, it might have been Mr. Pfeiffer, you know, what conversations you had with, with haulers. Um, you obviously knew that Mark was here. Did you talk specifically to Mark, or did was did you talk specifically with any hauler about your concern or your question, or just trying to garner how how some of this information you got with respect to the haulers you know, you arrived at? Sure. So I'll answer that in two parts. One is that we did not, to be clear, we did not do a an effort to meet with every single hauler in the city. So we have not done that yet, okay? Um, and as far as the information that we have received so far that was presented this evening was much more, um, when I, I think referring to the, you know, us providing the pricing, for example, in the city, that all came from our conversations with residents and what they okay. were paying, right. okay? Not with the haulers. Okay. Um, and as far as my conversations with Mark, um, I've, I've worked with Mark on uh, at other capacities with the um, Colorado Association for Recycling, which is now Recycle Colorado, um, and other endeavors. So I've, you know, I've talked to him about what we've, you know, been considering here in the city, and certainly heard his opinions. But um, that's that's about the extent of our conversation. Fair enough. And I forgot you work in the industry, in, yeah. so I, I forgot about that. But I think it's great that Mark's here and, and listening to this as well. So again, I appreciate you know, the work that the committee has done. You, this is a, a huge undertaking. Um, and so, you know, I, I wait and see what, where we go and, you know, how, how council may proceed with your requests and your recommendations. But I really appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. Ms. Ford. So I'd like to ask, um, add a few more comments uh, to the evening. Um, First of all, I'd like to answer uh, John's question about HOAs because it's actually something that has happened to me. 
Um, I live in an HOA of 256 units, and we have a waste hauler. And when I'm not happy with the service, I call up my waste hauler. And what I love about the fact that I live with 200 uh, in a 256 unit complex is, is that my waste hauler listens to me. And I know that for a fact, because I can go back to my HOA and I can say, you know what? This waste hauler is not doing a good job. And they know that we're a good customer for them because they can come into my tiny little complex of 256 units, pick up the trash in no time, and they're gone. Now, another story from my past is, is that when I moved to Arvada from Fort Collins 10 years ago, there was no waste hauling here, and I was used to throwing out my recycling. And it was very upsetting to me because regardless of whether my city says you're going to recycle or not, I'm going to recycle because it's a value that I hold very strongly. It's, it's my stuff, and I want to get rid of it the right way because we as a country are producing a tremendous amount of trash that has never been produced in the history of the world. And so I don't want to leave young people with a lot of trash. The other thing that you haven't mentioned, which I think is very important to mention, is that there are businesses that can be formed by taking recycling and reusing or re making, remanufacturing things. We, I'm on the, I represent the Arvada Sustainability Advisory Committee of which I was a member since its beginning because I was one of those citizens who were complaining, who was complaining to Jessica, who was our sustainability coordinator at the time, where can I recycle my items? And I got tired of throwing my waste in Westminster's recycling bins. I got tired of trying to find a church that had recycling bins because half the time I'd go, I'd fill up my car, I'd go to the church, and it was full. And here I have all this recycling. What do I do with it? So for me, it was a hassle as a citizen of Arvada. And so honestly, like Dot, I am thinking it is time. There should be no discussion about it. It's time. It's 2018. We have a lot of trash that we need to deal with in an ethical way and think about the future of our Earth and stop worrying about petty things because guess what? I pay $8 a month for my trash and I pay $28 a year for recycling. How much cheaper can it be? It's time. Okay, Ms. Ford, th thank you. Thank you for stealing my campaign slogan for all these many years. But <laughs> it's. Uh, Okay, well, like Mr. McGough, I was sitting up here in 2011 when, you know, when the cry was, you will pry my cold, dead fingers off my trash can. And that mentality is out there, and I, I applaud all of you for being here, but we're going to, you all have to realize, we're going to have to listen to those folks because there's going to be particularly some small trash hauling companies who are going to you know, get the rabble rousers out to, to come before us and tell us all the reasons why we should not do this. Not unlike uh, Mr. Jones, I live in a great HOA community. I have, uh, with all deference to Mark, I have waste management as my, uh, as my trash hauler. They do a terrific job. We have one truck per week for normal trash. We have an additional one every other week for recycling. And I can tell you, I personally have dramatically increased my recycling as a direct result of having the 96 gallon or whatever the biggest, you know, rollout that they've got 
um, uh, for recycling. In fact, my, I almost wish that they would pick up my recycling every week and my other every other week because it's, that's the way my trash is. I have, because of the, because I have two trash bins in my kitchen, I can separate it easily. I fill up the recycle one much more frequently than I do the regular trash anymore. Um, and, you know, uh, Mr. Jones and I have joked about, you know, having the little logo on top of the trash can so I know what goes in which one. And that's, that's been great. So I, I feel I'm, my attitude on this has changed a lot since 2011 uh, from the perspective that, wait a minute, I personally live in a neighborhood that gets the benefit of, of having a single hauler. I get the benefit of recycling. I understand where, where Mr. Marriott is coming from, from the perspective of, you know, do we need big brother government telling us who we can use? But it's, I'm, I'm seeing the fact that because I can live in the ivory tower of a, of a HOA where my neighborhoods dealt with this, that there are so many parts of our community that don't have HOAs, will never have HOAs, won't have the, the economy of scale, who am I to say that the rest of Arvada has to stay the way it is, even though I get to benefit from what I have in my community? So um, I think we as a council have to decide now, and we're not going to decide tonight, uh, but we are going to have to decide what's going to be our approach to uh, public hearings, uh, at which point expect us to get beat around pretty good. Um, because it's still going on in Westminster. It's certainly been going on in Lakewood. Even though it's, it's seven or eight years later, we're still going to hear that flavor from some folks. So if we want to see this happen and we want to do it as a council prior to election season happening, then we better put on our big boy and girl pants and do, deal with it. Uh, or if we decide that the better approach is let's put it to the citizens and let them uh, give us an advisory opinion, uh, an advisory vote, we could certainly take that approach as well, but we as a council need to have that discussion. And so um, I guess, Mr. Daly, maybe I'll ask you what's going to be the best way for us to, to move forward in that approach. Well, I think we've, uh, I think we've heard uh, from council tonight, and uh, my recommendation would be to allow staff to meet based upon the feedback that we've gotten tonight and then come back to the council with an approach. Okay. Well, I will, I will certainly second what Mr. Devin has said. He was given very explicit orders, don't touch this. Um, and, and because it, it was not a pleasant uh, experience and we wanted to let things calm down a bit. We did want the sustainability committee to go out and do its work and do its analysis. Um, and you have done so. You've, you've made a compelling case uh, we'll see whether or not that compelling case stands up against the other side when they get their chance to give it, because there will be another side presented. And uh, we need to hear both sides. Uh, but that's, that's where my sense is of, you know, my sense is that both because of changes on council members and in my case, a change of attitude, um, why we need to continue to get to a closure on this as to, as to how we're going to move forward. Okay. Yes, Mr. McGough. I'd like to just add one historical note, and uh, that is that there was a time in Colorado just a little over 100 years ago when it was the belief that there should not be municipal water systems. Denver had many water systems delivering to various parts of the city, various quality of water. There were five companies finally standing in 1918 when Denver Water was acquired and bought those five companies over the objections of lots of people saying that's not a government function. We like our water distributor. And of course, they liked it better if they were at the front of the line than if they were at the back of that water line. <laughs> Denver Water consolidated from those five companies. The water quality went up. The delivery service has been consistent for the last 100 years. And it's no longer a question, is the delivery of water a, government, a legitimate government service? I think there are parallels 
to the trash collection service. Thank you. I, I agree that there's parallels, but I am not hearing any desire of city council to take over trash hauling by the city. No, and that's where Thank the you. comparison, it's not, a, it's not a direct comparison, okay. but there is a comparison with saying, is there a legitimate interest by the government in providing a service? Sure. And okay. not in any different way from what has been presented here tonight. Right. Mr. Fiver. No, forgive me, Mayor, I know you just gave your last speech, but I want to be very clear on, for you all, that if we go down this path, which it sounds like we are, uh, we expect you to be there to help and support and understand and collaborate and think through all of this and continue your outreach for forever, really, on this. Um, because I, I don't want, uh, what I don't want to envision, I know you've done a year and a half, but then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's council's problem, drop it and then move on. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be a public hearing, like the mayor said, and there's going to be arguments on both sides. So, it, the, you know, it's not over. We, we are very well aware of that, and we are here today to tell you that we are right there with you, and we are going to continue to be working in the community. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, let's uh, do another quick uh, stretch in place, and then we'll do our final workshop for the night.
Okay, we'll, we'll reconvene. I just don't feel like there's as many people, Mr. Devin, who are excited about our third topic for tonight. The Comprehensive Plan Implementation Update. We got a few folks, though. So, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we'll start with Loretta Daniel, who will uh, start the presentation. We have a number of staff here who will be contributing. Very good. Well, good evening, Mayor and members of council. Uh, we have been before you last year, December, and we did an update on the comprehensive plan. And we're back again, so I'm just going to do a very, very brief introduction and then turn it over to my colleagues as we'll go through the highlights for 2018. But just to kind of, uh, as a refresh here, our comprehensive plan was approved in October of 2014. Through extensive outreach, it really relays and conveys the multi-year vision for the city. We have a document that really is used very heavily. It's not a doc document that sits on the shelf and gathers dust. We do use this to guide development investment decisions. And also, too, the comprehensive plan really came out of a community vision back in 1964, when this community was really only about 20,000 people. And it's been updated approximately every decade. So we are certainly growing. We're in a time where there is growth and fluctuation. So I just have a couple slides here for demographics. We have grown since 2000, we've added about 12,374 new residents, but that is really comparatively not that much when we look a little bit further back in time. Certainly the 2000s was a period of very slow growth with less than 5,000 residents added for that whole decade, but our boom period was really the 1960s and the 1970s when 30,000 and 35,000 people were added in those two decades. So since our comprehensive plan does have projections here, I just wanted to include this slide. The blue line, uh, which shows the actual population growth, uh, the numbers in 20, in, sorry, in 2000 and 2010 for the census are highlighted in green. And then our estimate of a uh, little over 118,000 is highlighted in yellow. So you can see those blue dots there that are really the estimate numbers. The red line is the projection that came out of the 2014 comprehensive plan, and it goes out to 2035. And you can see that we're tracking a little bit above the projection. It's about a 3% difference. So that's just to kind of show you that we are in a little bit of a gain period. Just wanted to point out, though, that that red line is a little flat. Um, following 2010, basically the projection was a, for slow growth coming out of the recession. So that's sort of that difference in the gain. So I'll just go through these slides very quickly. The core of the document that you have here is really the action matrix. So there's 153 policies in the comprehensive plan divided amongst the three chapters. And the action matrix has the same layout as what you saw last year, basically indicating the policies, uh, council strategic result, lead departments, and the action um, implementation items. And then we've got this quick overview of these little icons to really show the status of the comprehensive plan action. So just to quickly compare 2017 and 2018, uh, we have the same number of implementation actions, 60 implementation actions for growth and economic development, the first chapter. And you can see that about half of the projects are really ongoing projects and programs. And we've got a little bit of a shift for 2018. We have uh, a couple that were completed, but still again, we have about half as ongoing programs. When we go to the next chapter, multimodal transportation, there are 32 policies and 36 implementation actions in 2017. You can see that a great majority of these are ongoing programs. And for 2018, again, a lot of these are ongoing programs, and we've increased the number of completed projects. And for vibrant communities and neighborhoods, the third chapter in the plan, there's 88 implementation actions, and again, you can see that the vast majority are ongoing programs, 
and we've completed about three additional projects within that chapter. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues and um, Daniel Riley from AIDA will be first up. Uh, good evening, Council. Thank you so much. Again, Daniel Riley with Arvada Economic Development. Happy to kick off uh, 2018 highlights. So uh, a couple of things in regards to uh, one of the goals uh, from the economic developments uh, section, the plan for well-located high-quality commercial developments. The policy is uh, 3.1, commercial development and centers, uh, plan for commercial development at major intersections, discouraging and limiting strip commercial development along arterial roadways. Uh, a great example of that is what's gone on over at uh, Candelas and that commercial center there, anchored by the King Supers, which I know uh, you're all very familiar with. Um, the other one I'd like to highlight is in regards to the economic development goal number one, <coughs> expand and diversify the city's economic base to create primary jobs, increasing the city's fiscal uh, capacity to meet the needs of its citizens. So we're focusing here on policy 1.1, new commercial and employment development. Uh, promoting and supporting commercial employment development by recruiting primary jobs and increasing range of products and services of citizens. So there's two uh, projects here that came to fruition in 2018 that we wanted to highlight. One is the microspaces at IBC. Uh, so that's out on 68th and Holman. There's um, a microspace uh, a commercial development there which allows uh, entrepreneurs and other small businesses to own small footprints of, of space that can be used for various uses. Uh, three buildings that went up out there so far, uh, about 50 plus jobs kind of consolidated in that little development and plans for a lot more growth and expansion of those buildings. And then the photo on your right is the brand new uh, Lutec uh, manufacturing facility. They're a manufacturer of custom uh, uh, window treatments and they're out at Tower Place and they've got about 35 jobs and, and added another eight uh, in this facility as they expanded into it. That's an existing Arvada business. So very excited to see uh, some of these goals starting to play out in the community. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Maureen Fair with Aura. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So for Aura, we are really concentrating on two of the goals. The first one is to encourage development of transit supportive, higher density, mixed use, pedestrian oriented area. So you can see here at the Kipling station, the gateway apartments and also the new access off of Kipling. So this represents the transit supportive and the higher density and it is phase three of the mixed use project. Here is uh, at the Old Town Station, the Old Town residence, again high density at the transit and is phase one of a mixed use project. The second goal that we're working on is to designate and promote redevelopment and infill to generate economic revitalization, improve physical conditions, and provide an appropriate mix of quality housing choices. So this you can see is improving the physical conditions by undergrounding the power lines. Another example of improving the physical conditions is the, um, the new sidewalks along Ralston. And here is an example of uh, generating economic revitalization. And here is uh, an example of quality housing choices. So this is the old Arvada Square, which we are working with a developer to do senior housing. And in fact, our neighborhood meeting on this is this Thursday at five o'clock at Apex. And I would encourage everybody, if they can, to come. And this is the former Safeway, and we are working with, develop, with a developer to do townhomes on that site, representing a mix of quality housing choices. And with that, I am turning it over to Mr. Talbot. Well, now I get a chance to uh, answer Councilwoman uh, Miller's question in a little bit more detail. So I'm gonna go basically into two projects that highlight some of the work we've been doing. The first is on goal in, 2.2 to disperse low income assisted housing and improve the housing in Southeast Nevada. So this particular project here is Park Terrace Apartments, 96 unit development, built 1972. Okay. So 
this was done uh, with assistance through CHAPA. It came to the end of its affordability period. Generally what that happens, the partners are no interest who have tax credits on it are ready to go and the projects very often tend to turn at this time. That was happening with this particular project. So to cut to the chase on it was that the development entity, a for-profit, was wanted to pick this project up. They wanted to do three things on this. You heard about tax credits. They want to do 4% tax credits, not the 9% credits. When you do 4%, you don't get as much equity out of the sale of those credits, so you got to go someplace else. Where you go is to private activity bond financing and to the state for their low-income housing tax credits. If you can put those three pieces together, it pencils out. So they went to the state, to Chaffa, to say, we'd like to get private activity bond financing. We need about $10 million worth. Chaffa is over, not oversubscribed, very tightly subscribed for their private activity bonds or tax exempt bond financing. We were in a position, we requested, can you work with this to help get up that cap? And due to the wise decision of the council, we transferred or assigned $6.1 million of our 2018 PAB to Chaffa, and that facilitated this piece of the project which brought it together. The beauty about this, this was done as a Section 8 project and will remain Section 8 for very low income households for the next 20 years as a result of the deal. It's a good project that shows that preservation. Indeed, that we have to look at the preservation of the projects we have. Mr. Mary, Mr. I've got a question Can here. Go back one slide. I want to just ask you a question about that one. You betcha. So the comprehensive plan's goal is to disperse low income assisted housing throughout all of Arvada or just through Southeast Arvada? Through, uh, my understanding would be is that it's dispersed at appropriate locations, assisted housing throughout the community. And so in this photo that you have with this slide, directly to the east of these park terrace mm -hmm. is what? That's an apartment complex that's owned by the Jefferson County Housing Authority. So both of those two apartment complexes are all Section 8 housing. Uh, the one on the east is not Section 8, but it is owned and operated by Jefferson County Housing Authority as, a, as attainable housing. As, as attainable housing. Yes, sir. So the, the, how, does, how does this, I'm not questioning the validity of this project, obviously rehabilitating and providing units for people, but how does that further the comprehensive plan's goal? Because it seems like it just put a put them all in one place. Yeah, what we've got is we've got existing projects and then we have the opportunity for new. And when we're looking at new projects, is there places we can go outside Southeast Arvada to develop additional assisted housing? I think that's the thrust of the policy. For example, we have a lot of assisted uh, senior housing in Southeast Arvada, Columbine Village 1, 2, and 3, for example, a lot of senior housing there. Those units, if they come up, at the end of affordability period, I think would be in the interest of the city, since they're already located there, to see what we could do to make sure we maintain, not add new, but in that instance, to maintain that assisted housing rather than lose it yeah. from the housing stock. I guess my only question just is, I'm not disputing the, the, the need to do that. It's just my question is, is if the, the goal of the comprehensive plan is to try to disperse low-income assisted housing, how are we doing that? I think... It doesn't seem like we're doing that at all. Well... I would say that as opportunities come up to develop housing outside the southeast area, and I'm thinking of new housing, not transplanting housing, but if new opportunities come up, that's something we can go to. And that was one, I think, a goal and objective with the uh, Hometown Initiative, where we did that study to basically say, where are land parcels throughout the city that might be appropriate, understanding this policy, that we could put out there in front of the development community to see if there may be interest in those sites for new housing development. Okay, but, but there aren't any at the moment. It's just, if it comes up, we would. Well, well, for example, one that would be new is outside Southeast Arvada. You know, it's a challenge project, as I explained, would be the one at 64th and Sheridan, sure. which goes right in line with your strategic results of trying to get more you know, assisted right. senior housing. And right. that would be an example of something for new housing construction developed outside right. Southeast. Okay, so move to your next slide. Yes, sir. Because I want to point out that this one is about a block down the street from the last slide you just showed us. So That's just, correct. Just so people are clear. Understand that. <laughs> just saying. The, ro the, role of, uh, <laughs> the role of Lorraine Anderson is being played tonight. Because <laughs> Lorraine used to complain about this all the time, appropriately, that you know, we need to, to 
to diversify and, and disperse where the low income housing is. That's the, that's the message that I think Mr. Mary has tried to get and, that, and that's my only comment. I'm not, I'm, I'm not complaining about low income housing. We need it in our community. And I think we have an appropriate goal within our comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. But, but that, that if that's a goal in our comprehensive plan, we need to be working towards that, which I'm just pointing out that so far we have not made much progress on that particular goal in our comprehensive plan. Doesn't mean we haven't made progress in providing subsidized housing, but, uh, but, but that, that's a goal in our comprehensive plan that we ought to be trying to work towards. Yeah, and I think what you're pointing out is it's a difficult area here that is complex in terms of what's best for the community relative to affordable, attainable housing, be it new construction, be it rental, be it homeowner, what have you, and what are all the various ways we try to approach that problem. And it's not as clean sometimes as we might like it. And, and this might be an example kind of coming up to your point, I believe, is that looking at this particular site, about 1.2 acres, this was a site that was held by the city, no longer needed, was a surplus piece of ground, and just as Ms. Power said, land is crucial. That is the key issue. We were able to pick up a smaller parcel, 1.2 acres, that was deeded over by your action to the housing authority. We did talk with some developers to see what could be put on such a small site. We had about three different discussions. The one that floated up was Habitat for Humanity for a home ownership product for first-time moderate income, first-time home buyers because that's the model, basically. We all know that Habitat really shoots for in terms of what they try to do. So we're actually trying to work on this particular site with Habitat. We don't know if it'll work yet. There's a concept we're gonna be talking about to see if it'll work and fit onto the site. It's another one that's been uh, challenging, but I'm gonna remain confident that we'll be able to come up with something here that'll work well. So those are my two. <laughs> Good evening, Carice Canales, Neighborhood Engagement. So the, in the city manager's office, we'd really like to highlight that we've been working towards the goal of N3, which is to maintain and improve the quality of existing housing stock in Arvada and revitalize the physical and social fabric of neighborhoods that are in decline. So we're looking specifically through the lens of using neighborhood engagement and organization to do this. Um, and really since its launch in February, we've been using our Neighbors Connected program to be the driving force to really improve the social fabric of our neighborhoods. Um, and the way that we do this is by providing resources to our neighbors so that they can come together and get organized. Um, and as you may recall, in March of this year, we did accomplish our city council strategic results um, which was around organizing the unorganized neighborhoods and providing the city with liaisons. Um, and so we also were able to leverage a lot of engagement through pop-up events, such as um, the photo on the right is a pop-up um, playground renovation event. So two of our new playgrounds that will be coming to the city in 2019. Um, it was a great space for spontaneous community building. We've also been working to leverage Arvada's cultural, recreational, and educational assets for new economic opportunities. And that has been through public art and our arts and culture master plan. So as you also may recall, uh, City Council adopted that master plan in June of this year. And it included specific goals such as uh, taking lasting care, of the art that Arvada acquires, uh, creating funds for public art, and making sure that there's something artful in every neighborhood. So really, um, even having something artful within a five to 10 minute walk of every Arvada resident. And so to help achieve this goal, the city manager's office and our parks department partnered with a local Arvada artist who currently runs Art Drop Arvada. And so this was an initiative where we could get art into the community. We were able to expand her program so that she could create this art in your park guidebook, which you see on your screen. And um, she could also do additional monthly art drops in underutilized city parks. 
So it's all about getting our residents to think more creatively about their neighborhoods and get that art out at a hyper-local level. Um, and she'll really be focusing on distributing these Art in Your Park guidebooks um, as much as possible throughout our community so we can spread art far and wide. So I'm gonna let Sarah Washburn come up next to talk a little bit more. Good evening, Mayor City Council. Uh, Sarah Washburn representing Parks, Golf, and Hospitality. Um, the city initiated um, and city initiated and resident-led events helped leverage our festivals and events uh, goals and policies this year. Earlier this year, we launched our first ever winter fest that um, kind of historically uh, historically underused time of the year in the winter time. Um, so that was a brand new festival. And on the, on the far right hand side, you're seeing the outcome of what Carice just mentioned with the Art in Your Park uh, art drops. So here is a resident led event that activates the parks, it gets our residents out exploring and, um, and being active in, in events not even led by the city. Um, with regard to distributed parks and facilities and strategically placed parks, rec centers, and well-connected trails and preserved open spaces, uh, we accomplished two, two um, facilities, two new facilities this year. Um, the, the first one being the Westwoods Golf Club. So that was not only uh, supporting the um, city council comp plan, but also uh, completing the city council strategic results. So that opened earlier this year. And another city investment that opened this year alongside Apex and um, Jefferson County School District was the partnership to implement and build the Fitzforest Recreation Center to again, um, ensure we have distributed parks and rec facilities throughout the city. And that was about 10 or more years in the making. Um, again, with regard to strategically placed facilities and specifically the parks and open space master plan, um, this is a number of trails constructed throughout the city this year. On the left is Barbara Gulch trail system, which is now mostly complete, the concrete's done. And on the right hand side, we have Lydon Creek trail construction. So again, we continue to close those gaps in the regional trail system. And by the close of the year, we will have over two and a half miles of new trails in the city. With regard to uh, maintaining park level of service and expanded open space, uh, continuing to work with developers to ensure open spaces, trails, and parks um, are distributed equitably with new residential development. So on the left, you're seeing uh, Sabelle's development, which was approved by City Council for a pre preliminary development plan earlier this year. And they're not only providing new trails, small tracts of open space, but helping us build a new, new neighborhood park on city-owned land. And on the right hand side is Haskin Station again, um, PDP approved this year. They will be adding additional open space uh, over six acres, as well as trail systems to add to the city portfolio. And now I'm turning it over to Brian Archer. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Brian Archer, finance director. So um, any good comp plan has to make sure that we can pay for what we're planning today and what we're planning for in the future. So I just have a couple of slides to highlight what we've accomplished in this past year. What you'll see on the left-hand side is uh, an artist's rendering of the Whisper Creek Station. Council will remember that through good planning that the police's um, tax increment funds are able to pay cash for this. This is currently under construction and should be open sometime in the spring. And on the right-hand side, you will see reference to our comp plan Council will remember throughout this past summer and really a project that started well back in 2013, we started talking about this current 10-year CIP plan and this was adopted most recently in October, including um, the items related to 3F. So that was approved this November by our citizens and we will see hopefully starting in 2020 those two new roads. The next item reviews about how we're going to actually generate the money to make um, the different various payments, including our debt service, and then obviously our ongoing operations. 
Daniel already made reference to King Supers out in Candelas, of which we did an agreement with them to get them to come to our city three years earlier than they were planning. And then on the right, um, we also did an agreement with Harkins to keep a city asset and to keep the theater in place. And they opened earlier this year and have done quite well. Now I'll turn it over to John Feruzzi. Good evening. Um, as you know, the uh, chapter, uh, one, one whole chapter in the comp plan is the transportation chapter, and it's chapter three. Uh, much of the policies and goals in, in the transportation chapter are ongoing, the majority are. And um, given that it's a multimodal transportation chapter, uh, the goals relate to bicycle, pedestrian, transit, and motorist uh, modes, the, all the modes of, of transportation. Um, as a result of uh, uh, the goals that we have, the multimodal goals, um, we have pedestrian enhancements as part of our ongoing uh, projects. Um, and what we have done to help organize some of those is to create a uh, crosswalk standard and evaluation of our uh, crossing locations um, and to help prioritize the locations uh, between 2016 and 2017. And uh, we started to, in 2018, establish rectangular rapid flash and beacon protected crosswalks. Uh, we have seven locations that we have completed projects this past year. Uh, we also have added uh, multi or uh, ADA um, uh, compliant uh, ramps and sidewalks throughout the city at various locations to complement some of these improvements as well. Uh, West 60th Avenue, as well as Car Street and uh, uh, development related uh, sidewalk projects have been completed recently um, as a result of these policies. Uh, we also worked on a bicycle master plan um, uh, and started the implementation of that uh, throughout 2018 uh, with the city's resurfacing projects throughout the summer. And um, we established our first buffered bike lanes on Pomona Drive. Um, these are, uh, there were three locations uh, specifically where we implemented um, uh, lower stress bike lanes. Uh, P Pomona Drive, West 62nd Avenue, and uh, we, we added some side paths along uh, some of the busier roadways uh, with development projects. Hey, hey, John. Yes. You know, I'll bring up the Pomona Drive one because I got a lot of complaints about it, but um, when we do that, when we can you go back to the other screen? Yeah. The concern the neighborhood's given me is they love it, so it's not really a concern, but concern becomes is that it's along a big park that doesn't have parking and so everyone parks in the bike lane um, so any thoughts around when we do this in other places um, how we handle those conflicts when you're trying to meet this goal sure um, so in in most cases um, we plan the locations based on uh, where there aren't there isn't as much parking demand and therefore there aren't as many um, uh, issuance of citation and, and violations. Uh, but in some cases uh, that does occur and um, we take two type of measures usually. We um, post signs in locations that are not particularly clear for motorists, uh, but generally we don't post signs along all the bike lanes. So in some cases we have to actually uh, use the existing markings and um, through enforcement uh, issue cita citations for folks that don't quite understand that they shouldn't be blocking uh, a bike lane. So um, usually they get warnings when they start and then if they continue parking in, in bike lanes, they get citations. And in this scenario, um, okay. Well, I just wanna make sure we're not putting out things that will one, either create that conflict, like here we're, we're putting it along a park that doesn't have parking. Um, you know, kind of be more thoughtful when we're trying to execute on this goal on, on that, that conflict situation because it, it's creating a, some neighborhood concerns around. I don't mean to digress on this one, but you're trying to use that as you're achieving your goal. And, and I think it'd be really um, interesting on how we can maybe uh, minimize those when we're trying to achieve these goals, those conflicts. Absolutely, yeah. and we uh, sent Without out letters and postcards yeah. uh, for, for the affected residents, but obviously parks attract folks from outside of maybe the adjacent neighborhoods, so yeah. 
Um, as part of the uh, transmission chapter in, in the comp plan, we also have um, goals to help with uh, intersections and places where we have um, uh, both a linkage between land use and transportation, as well as improvements to the transmission network. Um, and we're on an ongoing basis monitoring traffic data, uh, such as volume and speeds. Um, as part of the uh, process, we are looking for warrants uh, to see which intersections are meeting uh, various warrants for uh, uh, signals, as well as uh, stop signs uh, for different uh, controls. But also uh, along the process, we are also looking to see how we can upgrade and improve operations of our uh, intersections and help with safety uh, aspects of, of the uh, roadway operations. Um, three uh, signal upgrades were um, initiated uh, through grants this past year. Uh, we have had uh, CIP projects such as the Indiana and, and 72nd Avenue project, major projects that are, have uh, started. And um, some are in the uh, completion phase, such as Kipling and 55th near Red Rocks uh, Community College. So given that um, intersections are, are kind of a big project, they span multiple years, but uh, several are, are well underway and nearing completion this particular year. And I'll turn it over to Ron or Rick. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Rick Osmus, Information Technology. Um, our goal in Information Technology is, um, with the comp plan, is to pursue the use of rapidly changing technology to deliver services. So what you have there before you is a map uh, of our master fiber plan. Um, we're in the process of implementing this master fiber plan, building it out. What you're looking at is the dark blue dots represent um, our school districts, buildings, uh, the red dots are the fire district facilities, and then the turquoise dots are the city facilities. So the map you show, uh, that you're looking at now shows the progress we've made since 2000. 2001 to 2016 is represented by the orange lines, and that is actual conduit and fiber that we have in the ground. And then looking at the purple lines, that shows what we have been able to do in 2017 and 2018, um, which is showing a lot of progress towards uh, building out our master fiber plan. So all said and done, we have over 33 miles of conduit in the ground, and we are looking to start filling that conduit with fiber in 2019. And in doing so, we're, uh, that'll give us the ability to stay up with whatever changing technology, and then also start implementing the smart community technology that's out there. Um, just to kind of update you on the, on the red dots, the blue dots, the turquoise dots, we, um, we have passed conduit by 11 out of 13 of the fire protection facilities, 17 out of the 32 Jefferson County public school facilities, 17 out of the 19 city of Arvada facilities, including two radio towers. However, that does not include our SCADA system. And then out of that, uh, roughly 61 out of 84 traffic signals. So we feel like we've got a really good start on our fiber master plan and, and getting it implemented. Mr. Fiber. Yes, sir. Yes, so Rick, I've been meeting, uh, and this is also for council, I've been meeting with Jefferson County Schools on fiber and some other things. And um, I have to say that, and this is for Mark, that hands down, they think so highly of Arvada and working together to solve a digital divide issue and cost issue for the schools, and it's become a model in the state. I don't know if we all realize and appreciate how many times we as a city and our staff do this day in and day out without us even knowing up here. Um, I found this out through conversations with their CIO and stuff of other topics to find out how much high regard they have you and, and the IT department uh, doing this because now what's happening is everyone's trying to mimic what Arvada and Jefferson County Schools did to make this happen. So I, I just want to call out that this goal was beyond reaching of our, our borders. I mean, yes, it impacts our citizens, but thinking with the schools and our partner groups has made it more of a regional and a statewide model that uh, I applaud and I, I get excited that we're a leader again in another topic. Well, a lot of credit goes not only to us, but also back to the council because I know the mayor has preached over and over about partnership, and I think that comes from the seven of you 
um, working on partnerships with our, our neighbors. And we've done that with the fire district and with the school district. And it's a, we're really close to having a couple IGAs with them. And this shows the progress that we are really moving forward, yeah, working thank, together. I, I just could say, I can't say enough. So thank you for doing thank that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Echoed by all of us. Uh, Mr. Jones. I just want to tag on to what uh, Mr. Piper was saying. I've had several conversations with Comcast over the last several months, and they say the exact same thing, that working with the city of Arvada with co-locates and what have you, they said that really they're benchmarking everything that they're doing in every other city against what you've done here. And so again, kudos to you and your department in, in, in working so collaboratively with the, the providers as well. Um, because they, you know, they have recognized and see a marked difference in the way it used to be done. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, John McCormick's not with CenturyLink anymore, so That's I don't right. know what you did there. <laughs> All right. Next up, I believe, is uh, Jim Sullivan. Uh, Jim Sullivan, Director of Utilities, and when I pop up, means we're getting close to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't seen a single cat slide yet. I don't know what's <laughs> working on those. So uh, the goal here is uh, the Gross Reservoir Expansion Project and water supplies. Uh, these projects take decades. It was 1999 when we signed the first agreement with Denver Water to be involved in this project. Uh, we've got, gotten all the way through to uh, the financing agreements, which are all in place. Uh, Denver is continuing to work through their uh, permitting process and building their coalitions to make this reservoir happen. Uh, right now we're waiting on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to issue a permit. Uh, projected costs, they're still saying about uh, 2019, they should be able to get things underway. And uh, they would take about five to six years to finish. Uh, we would obtain about 3,000 acre feet out of this at a cost of about $100 million. But it would provide all the water that the city needs for, for build out. Have you done a recent analysis of how much money the citizens of Arvada have saved because of that settlement we reached with Denver Water? I have not, but I think the last time we looked was about $68 million. I'm sure I'll, it's gone up from that. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Uh, the other side of this is, of course, water conservation, which we're continuing to plug away at. Uh, we've been in partnership with Resource Central. Uh, we've done Garden in a Box, uh, very popular uh, landscape seminars. We've sold out. We have three of those a year, and we sell them out every single time with a waiting list. And then we've had individual landscaping consultants where someone will come out to your house and actually look at your yard and tell you how you can change and improve it. The biggest barrier to getting someone to work, though, has been getting rid of the turf. And Resource Central, which really works metro-wide, says they've identified that. And they've got a project they're going to roll out in 19 to try and work on that. So we're going to be involved in that one as well. And two slides wasn't enough, so I volunteered to help the police on this one. <laughs> um, and theirs was on the Whisper Creek, Creek Community Station. Uh, the construction has begun. We've got a uh, quick photo there. It looks identical to the others because we simply copied the plans, which worked so well. Uh, the facility should open to the public in uh, next year. Uh, so it's moving along very well. Questions on any of these? If not, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Or, oh, sorry. I'll be the book hand here. So with uh, growth and economic development, our major project has been the update to the Land Development Code. So we've taken our code, which uh, dates from 2008, and we're making it a more modern code. We're revising zoning districts. We'll be remapping the city. Uh, we're creating some new zoning districts, and then also tweaking, doing some revisions to some of the standards within the code. So what we've done is we've had three open houses as part of our community outreach. We had the first one in June, the second one on August 29th, and most recently, the last one on November 29th. We've had surveys, we've had response forms, and also, too, there's a, a snapshot here of the uh, online method that we've used to try and solicit comments as well, too, on the code. So we're uh, approximately a little over halfway through that, so anticipate the completion of this in the um, 
about January, February of 2020. So success for the comprehensive plan, I started off saying, you know, we don't let dust have, you know, collect on our comprehensive plan. We do use this document. We take it very seriously. We use it daily through development review and through the other departments, as you can see. So it is definitely aligned, as, since it is a forward-looking document, it is definitely aligned with how we do our investments within the city. It's also a tool as how we communicate amongst ourselves between the departments. We have our oversight committee, the members of which uh, spoke this evening, and then we have this action matrix for the updates, which kind of crystallizes everything that we do. And of course, we're here in front of you today. Now, what we'd like to do, because the comp plan is now four years old, we're proposing some updates to the comprehensive plan so that is in better alignment with the approved master plans, plans such as the bicycle master plan, the parks master plan, and others. So we're looking at a midpoint review of the comprehensive plan. We recognize that it's a very powerful tool to really crystallize the community's vision. So there have been changes. We've gathered about 5,000 new residents since 2014. So given that, that type of growth, we'd like to review the goals and policies to assess the need, if there are, should be some additional projects and programs. And then also too, we want to balance these citywide policies also too with the neighborhood perspectives. So our next steps is that we'll continue co coordination with council strategic results as you move through your process in the spring. And then we'll continue with our meeting of our oversight committee. We'll meet two to three times in 2019. So we'll assess actions, identify any new projects and programs. And then we'll also propose some amendments to the comprehensive plan. So we have this alignment between the comprehensive plan and approved plans. So, and then we'll also be before you again next December with the update for 2019. So if you have any questions. I think we've gotten pretty worn down by our two, <laughs> first two workshops in terms of specific questions. Yeah, certainly, uh, it's good to see all the, all the progress that's been made by all the different uh, folks who spoke tonight in terms of their respective departments, in terms of the, the great work that's gone on. It's, I think it's always good to reflect back on, on a year and, and a highly, highly successful year for the city of Arvada. I want to thank you and, and all the other presenters tonight. And uh, uh, even though we don't have any questions for you at this time, I think that's more a reflection that uh, we're feeling very positive about the direction that we're headed. So. With that, Mr. Devin, anything else you need from us tonight? Well, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this is the last workshop of the year. So thank you for hanging in there with us with, the, with these three items. Uh, January 14th, um, uh, we will present three items uh, for that workshop, a modified sketch plan for a potential project at 90th and Indiana with the annual demographics update. Uh, and, and you will see Loretta back um, uh, for, for that presentation, and it's being merged in with Elizabeth Garner of the uh, of DOLA, Department of Local Affairs, for a state demographics update. So we wanted council to kind of see both ends of the, you know, both the state and local uh, and regional uh, demographics, and this is uh, prior to your retreat on January 18th. So the feeling is, is that we will, uh, by that time, uh, have provided you with uh, a lot of really good solid background information as we head into the retreat on the uh, 18th. Um, so with that, um, um, thank you very much for hanging in there with all these items tonight. All right, very good, we are adjourned.